The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. First up this morning, we have evidence from two more community witnesses. We're going to hear from Jenny and Arthur Robb, small business people from Kaya, about 12 kilometres from Eden in New South Wales. In early January, the fires came through their property. Their house survived, but the property burnt, and they lost all their sheds. Tourism is a key part of the local economy in that area, and they'll talk about the effect on their local community of the loss of tourism, as well as their personal experience in seeing to recover from the damage that they suffered. One thing that you might notice is referred to in their evidence is that a large proportion of their business comes from Victoria. And we know that in recent days, that border has been closed. And so that will be an additional effect on the people around Kaya and Eden and southern New South Wales generally that won't be included in their evidence, but is something that is worth taking into account. Their evidence was taken by video on their property in Kaya, New South Wales, on the 11th of June by me, by a video link. The evidence has been edited. The original footage of the Rob's evidence is also available. I would ask that we play. Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. So, Mr. Dovey, we've resolved the uh, the issue of getting the information out to the public. Uh, we will put the community witness uh, video on hold. We'll look to do that again later on in the day. And once we've got that timing, we'll make sure people know. Thank you. But uh, please proceed. Ms. Hogan Doran is going to. Ms. Hogan Doran, Victoria. sorry. That's all right. Uh, Commissioners, Chair, we will now have uh, the witness from Bushfire Recovery Victoria. I call Mr Lee Mises. Mr Mises, good morning. Good morning. Mr Mises will affirm. Mr Mises, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Mises, um, I'll have the commissioners taken to the State of Victoria's response to the notice to give, which is EMV 0015 0001 and at page 2 in paragraph 4. Um, it's noted there that recovery is led by local governments where they have capacity to coordinate relief and recovery. The scale of this event exceeded the capacity of individual local governments and impacted on multiple regions within the state. This meant that recovery was best coordinated at a state level. Accordingly, the government announced the creation of BRV, that is Bushfires, Bushfire Recovery Victoria. You're the CEO of that organisation. That's correct. Um, uh, what was, was there any recovery agency or any agency with responsibility for recovery activities prior to the establishment of BRV? So there's the, the responsibility for coordination of, of recovery prior to the establishment of Bushfire Recovery Victoria at the state level uh, sat with Emergency Management Victoria and the Emergency Management Commissioner and at the regional level uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, each department, so Victorian Government Department, did have particular roles and responsibilities, but at that coordination level, um, it sat with Emergency Management Victoria and Health and Human Services. And uh, is it now right that the whole of the coordination of the recovery effort sits with BRV? That's correct. So Bushfire Recovery Victoria has, has responsibility for, for coordination at the state level um, and at working with local government in, in coordinating activities at the, the municipal or regional level. Does BRV have, did BRV have a responsibility for immediate relief? Uh, no, we, we were established on, on the 6th of January and a number of those immediate relief activities were, were well and truly under, underway. 
um, and being delivered by, by the relevant agencies. So uh, being a new agency, we were very conscious about not disrupting. Dream for the hearing workers. That answers that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it suggested it wasn't recording to that point. <laughs> it's not recording to that point, but if it does record from there, we would have a visual record. Let's go on. You. So, Chair, the position is that um, parties with leave uh, have access to the uh, live stream the audio. and an audio feed. That's all parties with leave? All parties As I understand, all parties with leave. Uh, all parties with leave have access to, to the live, the the live, live transcript, stream, transcript and yes. audio feed. And audio feed. Um, the representatives State of Victoria should be video conferenced in, and we heard from Mr. Attawa, Attawa. Senior That's Counsel right. for Victoria, yeah. uh, with the witness. What is now being established is a recording of the uh, examination. Uh, it will be um, in a position to be uh, uploaded to the website uh, at a point later today. Um, obviously, we do not propose that there be any attempt to live broadcast because of the concern as to public um, public interest immunity or putting it up without there having been some yes. review before that exercise is taken. Okay, so we will continue with Victoria and at the end of this when we take a short adjournment, we'll look at how we are technically for the rest of the day. But we'll continue with Victoria at this stage. Okay. All right. Sorry, and just... Good point from Commissioner Bennett. Just uh, make sure there's no objection from Victoria in continuing that way. Are you happy to continue under under those conditions? Uh, Chair, would I just be able to receive, obtain instructions? I'd only need a, a few moments. Okay, and we'll we'll give you a few moments at the end. So that that's okay. Is that what you? No, you no he's asking for it now. Just quickly now, Chair. Oh, okay. Chair. Yeah, no, please. We, we will take just a couple of minutes, just a 60 second pause while you, you do that just to confirm and then uh, then we'll continue. Thank you. Yeah.
Oh, thank you, Commissioner. It's Richard Attwell here. Yes, Richard. This is confirming, Chair, that we're, of course, happy for it to proceed, just on the understanding that, obviously, it's being recorded and can be available publicly later on. OK, thank you. And that is confirmed? Yeah, and, that uh, is. So, yes? Yes. Oh, no, thank you, Chair. Thank you. We will continue with Victoria. When we adjourn after this, we'll, we will make an assessment of the technical situation and then we'll make an assessment of how we go with the rest of the day. OK? Yes, Chair, and I'm, in, I'm informed by the technical team that it is being recorded. Thank you. That's good. All right. Uh, Mr Mises, thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent you heard or can recall, so I'm going to repeat the question I asked you before we were interrupted. Uh, in paragraph 4.1, it speaks here to coordinating the recovery from the 2019-2020 fires. And in the second dot point, it speaks to providing financial support to local councils. To what extent does BRV have any responsibility for the financial assistance for financial assistance and the administration of the funding and financial assistance schemes? Uh, and so in terms of, of local councils and, and <coughs> particular provision of financial support for capability and, and capacity building. Bushfire Recovery Victoria work very closely with local government Victoria um, and the councils themselves in providing that funding. So the funding agreement for capability and capacity for recovery is between Bushfire Recovery Victoria and the local governments themselves. And what about in terms of dealing with funding uh, arrangements uh, with the Commonwealth? Is that BRV the lead in that or is it EMV? So it's a, it's a combination and I think just as a function of our newness as an organisation and, and established processes uh, within both the Commonwealth and, and the state. So whilst we have a, a role in negotiating and uh, uh, working with the Commonwealth and local government on what some of those programs might look like, the administration of that funding uh, remains with Emergency Management Victoria. And how large is BRV? Uh, at the moment, um, we are about 94 FTE. Um, so that comprises a, a small core um, team that, that is Melbourne based and, and two regional teams. So, so we work very quickly to establish a presence regionally in, in uh, bushfire affected communities, um, which includes both a, a, a regional management structure, but also staffing in community recovery hubs. The State of Victoria has experienced a surge in coronavirus infections with increased public health restrictions imposed and closure of the state borders. How will this affect those Victorians that are still recovering from the bushfire? So, as an organisation, um, I guess 75 per cent of our, our time in existence has been um, during the, the global pandemic and, and the, the restrictions that have been in place. So we have certainly had to adjust um, how we deliver those programs, but we've been very focused on the fact that the need for that support does not diminish. In fact, you know, when, when you think about it, it's sort of one disaster on, on top of another for, for many people and many businesses. So we've adjusted uh, how we have delivered services. Um, for example, in, in community recovery hubs, which would normally be a walk-in service, um, a lot of that access to those supports has been shifted to an online where the hubs either become a digital kiosk or have you know, appointment only access to, to services or with community recovery committees where we can't do you know, the traditional town hall meeting for people to come together to talk about those priorities. Um, we've made sure that we can do that online. Um, we've had to put additional constraints in around the cleanup program, um, particularly around the movement of crews, but we have not in any way um, load up that program. It, it's just been a way of how we've had to change the operating model to comply with the restrictions to make sure that those critical and important services continue to get delivered to those in need. What about the likely impact on, uh, on uh, some of the sectors that were particularly affected by the bushfires? We might go to page 21 of the state's response, paragraph 119. <coughs> The economic impacts were particularly concentrated in the industry sectors of tourism, retail, agriculture and forestry. Uh, and in paragraph 119.2, the impacted regions experienced a decline of 35 to 85 per cent in gross 
GVA stands for? Gross value added. Thank you. In tourism industries over the January to March 2020 period, uh, and also small businesses impacted by reduced visitation and expenditure. Um, uh, have you made any assessment or projections in relation to uh, how those regions will be impacted by way of for their tourist industries and their small business industries now that the um, restrictions have amped up again? Uh, so we continue to work really closely with the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions here in Victoria, who, who is really, really leading the economic recovery both from bushfire itself, um, but also from, from the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, that, that work would be and is being undertaken by uh, Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. We stay close to them um, and take a very pragmatic approach. And if, if I use the example of a small business um, that may have had a revenue impact, it, it's, it's very difficult to attribute, you know, what proportion of that revenue impact has been as a direct result of a bushfire versus um, you know, the, the pandemic or the restrictions caused by the pandemic. So we're very pragmatic. We stay very close to those that are, are working on the response to the pandemic to make sure that um, yeah, we're not only factoring that in, but we are making the supports as, as simple and as seamless um, to, to those in need. Um, you spoke about the difficulties of attribution, attributing uh, the cause of the economic impact being bushfires and or um, the impact of COVID-19. Has there been any proposal to merge the recovery efforts? Uh, look, I think in a, in, a, in a practical way that that is happening. Um, so I, I mentioned before, for example, um, economic recovery uh, in Victoria is led by the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. Now it is also leading the, the, the economic recovery uh, from, from the COVID-19 pandemic. So in a, in a practical sense, it's the same people working on the delivery of programs. Um, we are constantly, as I said, having conversations with, with the department to make sure that, again, we're, we're, we're taking a practical view of how the supports are delivered. Um, but we are still, you know, we are conscious that, that the bushfires have had a particular impact on those communities. Those those impacts have been uh, amplified, or, or, or you know, almost the double whammy of of, of COVID nineteen. So there is still that particular need and focus for, for those that are recovering from bushfire. Um, that the COVID nineteen does not replace that, and it's important that those communities know that you know, that they're not being forgotten. I'll just take you, you mentioned uh, that there had been some impact on the uh, uh, recovery and clean up processes uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can we go to the state recovery report issued on the 19th of June 2020, that's EMV 0015 0001 0059 uh, and page 63 which is the clean up status. I think, uh, Got a couple of questions on this document, but if we can go over to 6.3 and see the clean-up status uh, 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 pic uh, pictures or diagrams, uh, the it says there were 412 clean-ups completed as at 12 June, which is up 118 from the last state recovery report which is 62% of cleanups commenced of the 730 properties requiring cleanup as at 12 June. Just so I understand how this works, um, uh, the 412 cleanups are the ones that are done and the 730 are the ones that still require cleanup and of that 730, 454 have commenced but the balance have not commenced, is that right? No, so the, the 730 is the total number of properties that have registered for cleanup. Right. Of that 730, 412 have been completed, or as at this date, and 454 had commenced. And um, do you so have 412? Sorry, 412 is a subset of 454, which is a subset of 730. I see. So. 412 is a subset of 454, are you sure about that? Yes. So that suggests that there's about uh, 
42 left to, to complete? Uh, no, it, it's just that uh, about, there's about 42 that are currently being cleaned up at the time that this report was prepared. I see. Um, of that 730 properties requiring clean-up, you've said these are the properties that have registered. Do you have a sense of how many have not registered? Uh, no. We had, um, if I think about the initial um, registrations that we received, it was about 936. Um, now, when we went through those, there was a number of duplications. Um, some people um, withdrew. Um, from the program, um, but the other point I'd make here is 730 is, uh, as of yesterday, now 745, because whilst we had some people uh, withdraw or you know, remove because of duplications, there are still people now registering um, and, and were registering for the program right up until sort of the close-off date of, of 30th of June. I see. Um, it says uh, elsewhere in the response the clean-up is progressing and is on track for expected completion by 31 August. Is that end August uh, timeline likely to hold, what with the new COVID restrictions? Uh, yes, it is, absolutely. Uh, as, I, as I said, w we have not slowed up at all as a result of, of COVID. Um, we have had to put restrictions in place and, and for example, um, we've divided the, the bushfire affected area into 12 zones. We've made sure that uh, you know, those zones are managed independently and there's not um, you know, a lot of crossover. Um, we've also made sure that, you know, we, and we knew communities were concerned about contractors from outside of the area coming into their community and leaving at weekends. So we've seen and, and required contractors to, to stay in situ um, to, to manage some of those concerns. But um, whilst we've had to change those, make those operational changes, it, it has not slowed up the, the cleanup. As of yesterday, um, about 84% of, of all properties have now been cleaned up. Um, and that includes all primary places of residence. Um, so we are well and truly on track. So all primary places of residence uh, that registered for clean-up have been had their debris removed. Yeah, all that we're, all that, that we are aware of uh, have had their debris removed. All right. Um, can I go back to uh, the response of the State of Victoria, which is EMV 00150001, and at 0015. Um, I'm just taking you back to the questions concerning the removal of debris from properties damaged by uh, natural disasters, um, uh, which is question 16. Um, the question actually was broader than the most recent bushfires. It was speaking to properties damaged more generally. Do you know if there had been a program that dealt with this in advance? That is, that it was part of the existing recovery framework to have a plan, so should um, circumstances be that properties were damaged by natural disasters? Yeah, so, so the State of Victoria um, did a state managed clean up uh, in 2009. Uh, and, and has undertaken a number of state managed cleanups since that time. We have a panel of, of contractors um, that Emergency Management Victoria had established and that we were able to draw on uh, this time around. So, you know, whilst we were established on, on the 6th of, of January, we announced the appointment of GROCON and the, uh, as the contractor and, and the, that, that there would be a state-led uh, uh, cleanup program on the 17th of January. It, now, having those, the history of, of this and those pre-existing practical arrangements meant that we were able to move quite quickly in those announcements and, and importantly, give, give those who had lost their homes some comfort that the, the state would meet the costs associated with that cleanup. Um, as you know, the various states that have granted leave to appear have been asked throughout the course of these questions to provide suggestions for improvement. Uh, and the last question here is suggestions for improvement of efficiency, effectiveness and timeliness of such a program. Uh, can we go over to the response of State of Victoria, which is on the next page, 16, which is paragraph 100? Um, 
The answer here that's given here is that the state will monitor and evaluate the program upon its completion to identify ways it can be improved for future natural disasters. Um, as I read that, uh, Mr Mises, uh, the state of Victoria has not yet identified any ways to improve the program and won't undertake that task until after the clean-up program has been completed. Is that right? Uh, we, we will undertake a formal uh, evaluation of, of the program on, on its completion. Um, obviously, as we're delivering the program, we are identifying things that we think could be improved as, as we move forward, right. um, and we will feed those into that formal evaluation process. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is invite you to actually tell those to the Royal Commission now rather than waiting until after the um, completion of the program and then completion of your evaluation. Um, would you be able to identify those improvements that you have identified already? Yeah, so, so one of the, the, the key improvements we think we, we can make um, is how we balance up the, the, the need or without compromising the, the safety of, of the, the clean-up program, but the ability to incre increase the number of local workers that are involved in the clean-up itself. Um, at, at the moment, we have about 52 per cent of, of persons involved in, in clean-up that are working uh, our locals that are working on the program. Now we know that you know these are communities that have had significant ec economic impacts, and you know not only in clean up but in all the recovery activities that that we undertake, we want to maximise local job opportunities. Um, there has been there there are some challenges um, in the number of Class A contractors, and, and in Victoria, um, all bushfire affected sites um, are treated as though they are asbestos contaminated, which requires certain um, regula regulations to apply, in particular around the use of, of Class A contractors. Uh, in local areas, in, in, in regional areas, there are often a small number of, of contractors that, that have those Class A classifications, which means um, we, we haven't, we would have liked to have had more local content. But we will and have and will continue to work with um, WorkSafe as the regulator on what some of those changes we might be able to make to that system that that don't compromise safety. Recognising that you know that there is there is asbestos in some of these sites, but at the same time we are able to better meet our objectives for, for maximising uh, local employment opportunities. So, so that that would be a, a key one. Um, um, I think. Sorry, the, the other big learning for us um, is the need for much better communications. Um, if I reflect on, on um, I think we were waiting for, for perfection in our plans before we started communicating enough to the community about what was happening when. Um, and I think that was at the detriment um, to, to some people who just wanted a bit of certainty, even if those plans were potentially going to change. So. Um, I think we, we my, my two reflections um, are certainly how we work with WorkSafe to increase local local content uh, in the cleanup, um, recognising jobs are so important in, in, in these bushfire affected communities, uh, and secondly, just the need for, for regular communications, even if the plans aren't perfect, telling people what we know when we know it um, will assist. All right, thank you, Mr. Mr. Mises. Could we now go over to page uh, uh, 0018? I'm going to ask you just a short question on uh, the response of the State of Victoria to the questions on the natural environment. You might have heard me mention in the opening uh, this paragraph. We go over to page um, 0020, at the top of it, pa uh, paragraph 109. Um, it said here, Victoria seeks to promote long-term resilience post-fire for key impacted species and ecological communities, ensuring their survival and ability to recover after bushfire. Unless there is deliberate and focused investment, experts have agreed that the probability of some species persisting beyond 10 years is less than 1%. Um, what is being done, having, having made that observation uh, and having received that advice of those experts? Are you able to assist the Commission uh, to let us know um, what, if any, plan there is to deal with this issue? Uh, thank you. I, I don't profess to, to, to be an expert in uh, 
in, in, bio, in biodiversity. Um, you know, certainly these fires that impacted 1.5 million hectares in, in Victoria. 90% of that was our parks and forests, which are so critical to, to our threatened species. Um, so there are a number of programs being run at, at the state level. There was a, a $17.5 million biodiversity program um, that, that was announced um, with grants and, and other direct investment in um, biodiversity outcomes. We're looking at reforestation of, of some of those areas of, of, um, of uh, our parks and forests that have been burnt, recognising that you know, some of those areas were, were, was immature forest and it won't reseed itself and we'll need active I intervention. Um, so there are a range of, of uh, activities being undertaken, um, as there were during the fire with the um, you know, eastern bristle bird and, and other direct actions that were taken. Um, Subsequent to that, you know, a big focus on how we re restore and re-establish important habitat characteristics across that large area that was, was impacted by the fires. To obtain additional information on that, would the best uh, organisation or department within the state of Victoria be dwell? Uh, yes, it would. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to question six. Uh, back on page six. Uh, the State of Victoria was asked to describe any changes or improvements that the State of Victoria considers could be made to existing uh, recovery frameworks and approaches. Um, uh, it doesn't appear here that there are any suggestions being made uh, for improvements or any changes. Um, rather, it seems to be that it is saying that the, um, you'll wait for the IGEM to provide uh, recommendations. Um, is, th is that how I, need, I ought to understand those paragraphs, uh, Mr Mises? So I think t two points. Um, the, the first significant change that was made in Victoria in response to these fires was the establishment of Bushfire Recovery Victoria as a permanent and dedicated recovery agency. Um, the, fir the first one in Victoria recognising our, our closest predecessor, um, the Victorian Bushfire Reconstruction Authority um, established in 2009 had about a two-year life. So we've been established as a permanent agency and it recognises the unfortunate circumstance where you know, catastrophic fires like we saw in 1920 are you know, the, the new norm uh, in, in Victoria and and in, in announcing the establishment of uh, bushfire recovery Victoria as the permanent agency both, both our Premier and, and Minister for Police and Emergency Services certainly highlighted that fact um, that that we are experiencing more and more significant uh, bushfires that are having impacts on, on communities um, that, that agencies like uh, Emergency Management Victoria and, and, and uh, the Emergency Management Commission are increasingly needed to, to, to uh, drive and lead that, the response to those fires and that there was a need for a, a dedicated and, and permanent agency. So um, oh, that was an immediate change that was made. So um, we do have the, the Inspector General for, for Emergency Management uh, undertaking a, a thorough review of, of recovery arrangements and we expect and, and that process will identify further improvements that we can make. Right, I'm going to take that in two phases. As I understand the IGEM's activities, uh, the matters that the subject matter of his report relief and on relief and recovery won't be delivered this year. It won't be delivered until 2021, is that right? That, that's correct. All right. Has um, Bushfire Recovery Victoria been making any suggestions for improvements to the IGEM in relation uh, to the, the, the approaches and the recovery framework? Sorry, the, yeah, the, the Inspector General hasn't commenced the, the analysis or, or, or the inquiry into recovery at this point. Um, when it does, um, we will certainly um, look to input into that process. Um, I think the, uh, the the Royal Commission will be assisted knowing now because we won't be here next year. Uh, have there been any uh, um, improvements or changes uh, that have been identified by Bushfire Recovery Victoria in relation to the existing frameworks or approaches? Uh, look, I think as we have oper gone and delivered our and met our responsibilities as, as an organisation. We've had to be responsive to, to the needs of, of the community. Um, 
which has meant that we've had to adjust or amend some of those existing frameworks uh, as we've as we've gone along. A good example of that would be, you know, traditionally when we think about recovery, we think about four four lines of recovery, and, and you may have heard this in, in previous as evidence. Um, we deliberately. Um, following discussions with, with traditional owners and Aboriginal Victorians identified a, a fifth line of recovery around Aboriginal culture and healing. Now, that was to recognise the significant impact that these fires have had on, on Aboriginal people, um, but also to ensure that we have culturally appropriate recovery programs that, that are self-determined by, by Aboriginal people. So um, I use that as an example of as we have gone through and, and the, the delivery of recovery services as, as a new agency, we have been constantly looking at what are the needs of the community, what in the existing framework works, what doesn't, and what needs to be, to, to be adjusted. So you know, a, a, a new line of recovery is an example of that, but you know, we have always, as we've gone about our business, um, looked at you know, how do we make this work for this circumstance, recognising every fire is different and every community is different. I think in light of the, that response, um, Mr Mises, we might give perhaps the com commissioners the State of Victoria an opportunity to provide a supplementary response. Yeah, I was just going to jump in there, noting that this part of the IGEM inquiry hasn't even started yet. We're not crossing paths. So I think if you can reword that question for my signature this afternoon, we'll go back out with that, that question. And, and it's, it's more than just your area, Mr Mises. It's, uh, it's uh, Victorian to Victoria as a whole Indeed, can answer that. And so we wouldn't want to put you on a, on a spot. But I don't think the question was answered adequately. Uh, and I don't think we're crossing paths with the IGEM uh, review. That part hasn't started yet. Uh, and it won't be finished till long after we're, we're done, so we'll be putting that question back out this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you. Could we go to uh, 008, uh, which is Community Hubs, the Recovery Centres? Uh, question 10. Um, How does uh, Bushfire Recovery Victoria assess whether a recovery hub should be managed by local councils or community groups? or by BRV, or a combination of both? Um, so if I take the, the, the current fires, it, we were just very pragmatic and very practical in how, how we did it. So um, East Gippsland Shire had a Bansdale um, relief centre that was already up and operating. Um, the community was used to coming to that, that recovery centre. East Gippsland Shire had management structures already in place. Um, so it just made sense for, for East Gippsland Shire to continue to, to, to manage that um, and, and tr manage the transition of that from a, a relief centre into a recovery centre. And rather than us manage it directly, we provide support and assistance to, to East Gippsland Shire in managing that hub. In other places where there was not uh, a relief... Just one moment. Could we have the answer shown, please? Question 10 and the... All right, we'll leave it. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Mises, I just wanted to give um, uh, those following and the commissioners uh, the context of the question that I asked and the answer that you're helpfully providing, uh, which was about how the decision is made as to who will, who will manage and operate these recovery hubs. I interrupted yep. you. Please continue. No, so, so if, if I sum it, it, it's a very pragmatic decision that, you know, our number one focus is to make sure that we don't disrupt service delivery to, to community. Um, and, and as I was saying, in the case of, of Bansdale, um, East Gippsland Shire was managing that as a relief centre already. It had the structures in place. The community was used to dealing with the people in those centres, uh, in that centre. So it has continued to manage that. In other cases, um, we have made the decision in consultation with, with council to, to set up and establish the hub. And in doing so, we have employed a local person to, to manage that, that hub, um, again, with certainly with local government support. So um, there is no recipe for, for how those decisions are made. It is, um, I guess, a process that says, how do we deliver the best outcomes for the community um, in taking a very pragmatic approach? Uh, how does BRV determine what services should be provided in those recovery hubs? Um, by and large, in consultation with the community. Um, so we, we understood um, very early on as a result of, of uh, Ken Lay, who, who is the chair of, of BRV, very early on 
out consulting with over you know 32 communities um, that gave us good intelligence about what were some of the, the needs um, we knew from the relief centres what some of the important um, inputs were. We, we'd been meeting with, with community groups who were telling us about what some of those services were. So it was you know, very much, uh, and will continue to be driven by, by the community, the services that some communities need now um, or, or early on will, will change through, through time. Um, you know, right now, um, yeah, big focus on planning and rebuilding. So, you know, making sure that we have access to those services through the hubs. Um, you know, mental health, financial assistance. Um, you know, we'll be guided by the community in terms of the the types and the forms of support that they want through the the hubs, and equally how they want to use those hubs. So, you know, we know, for example, the Orbost um, community is wanting to hold um, yoga um, in its hub. Um, because they think that that's, they see that as an important part of their, their, their well-being uh, and a service that's important for that community. Now, that will be very different to, 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 to another hub. Um, so we, we really are just guided by you know, what are the needs of that particular community and how do we best deliver those services. Right. Could we go to the top of the page, the top three paragraphs on spontaneous volunteers? Um, how... You describe there the, the difficulty of having to manage large numbers of spontaneous volunteers, and this can be a challenging issue. Um, how can volunteers, based on the experience of BRV, uh, be better used in the recovery phase? Um, I, I think where we saw um, volunteers most effective was, was through those established organisations that play such an important role in recovery. So, so whether that was through Blaze Aid or through Rotary, um, or through those th those established um, organisations that have pre-existing relationships with local government or with with the emergency management sector itself. Um, you know, we did see early on large numbers of people almost turn up to communities with shovels, sort of saying, you know, what can we do and how can we help? And um, you know, that incredible generosity, um, you know, um, you know, what was and, and did prove somewhat difficult to manage. And, and um, you know, we encourage people to connect in with those existing uh, uh, organisations or equally um, to, to provide cash in kind of, of sort of volunteer efforts. So um, I would say certainly working with those pre-existing organisations that are so important to the, to the recovery process. We go to page 10, which is question 12, which is on funding, and you're asked to provide most recent figures to recovery funding payments uh, or assistance made available by the Commonwealth, states and territories, local government, charities and insurance companies to the state of Victoria. Um, you've provided the re state recovery report, which I identified earlier. Um, uh, try to get a sense, as it's not quite clear from this response, to what what is the contribution of the state of Victoria and what is the contribution of the Commonwealth? Okay, the, well, th there's a number of programs that, that, that are managed um, and, and delivered. So the, the state of Victoria's overall contribution or, or, or funding commitment is up around 317 million. So what you're seeing here is what, what's been um, accounted for or reported through the, the recovery report. Um, at this stage, the, the Commonwealth contribution um, is around, and I, I, I say around, um, because there are still decisions to be made on some of the allocation of some of the announced funding um, around 100 to 130 30 million. Um, the, the, the figures you're seeing here is a combination of state-based initiatives, uh, Commonwealth-funded initiatives, or jointly funded initiatives under disaster recovery funding arrangement. Right. Um, just for the benefit of the record, are you able to identify from on this, on this uh, series of answers, paragraphs 55 to 58, which other um, Commonwealth-funded initiatives, sorry, the state-based initiatives, the Commonwealth-funded initiatives or the jointly-funded initiatives? So in paragraph 57, um, e each of those um, would be well, 57.1, uh, 2 and 3, um, I understand to be jointly funded initiatives. Um, paragraph 57.4, so the, the small business bushfire grants, the $10,000 grants, um, for three local government areas, uh, Alpine, Tawong and East Gippsland, that is 100% Commonwealth funding. Uh, for the four 
four additional local government areas, uh, Wellington, Mansfield, uh, Indigo and Wangaratta, that is co-funded. I see. All right then. Thank you for that clarification. Um, if we could go, just while we're on the topic of funding, if we could go to the uh, shed of the appendix one, which is the state assistance measures, uh, that's EMV 0015-0001-0040. And what I wanted to get a sense of is on page 41, second, uh, third box, which is the type of level emergency relief assistance, which is up to um, an as a re-establishment payment of 42250 um, it, it is it right to understand this schedule to say, and if it's not, please send me where, tell me where to look. Um, if someone w had insured their house and some other person had not insured their house, either way, they would each be able to receive up to the same threshold, uh, same maximum amount. Is that right? Uh, so, so this program was delivered through the Department of Health and Human Services very early on in, in the recovery piece and hasn't wasn't Bushfire Recovery Victoria wasn't directly involved in this program. So um, unfortunately, I can't give you the details that, that you're looking for. All right, well, we'll follow up with them. Thank you for that, Mr. Prizes. Uh, now, we can go back to uh, page 31, question 37. Uh, the question here uh, was looking to the issue of um, people who live in different areas, different different LGA areas and different areas generally. Um, I want to take the question uh, a little bit uh, further, uh, which is 173, where you deal with the issue of people living in a cross-border community. Uh, now, um, my question is this. Um, You've said here that the particular barrier to ensuring consistency of treatment relates specifically to cross-border communities where there is not or is not yet a formal national approach dealing with different sides of a state or territory border. Um, I want to ask two questions that arise from this. The first is what is Victoria doing in the interim? That is, how do you treat and how have you managed um, this uh, uh, barrier of inconsistency of treatment? So if I focus on the, the recovery program itself that, that Bushfire Recovery Victoria is coordinating, um, we are you know, just working very, very closely with, with New South Wales and, in fact, um, you know, almost working as though the, the border doesn't exist um, in terms of how we work with communities because that's what communities are telling us. Um, so if I use the example of the, of, of the community of Walla uh, in, in northeast uh, or in the Upper Murray area in northeast Victoria, you know, when, when they've talked to us about the establishment of a community recovery committee, they've said, look, it makes sense when we think about a, a community recovery committee to include Gingillic in New South Wales. Um, we support that and we, we, we are working with, with New South Wales on, on making that happen because you know, that's just what makes sense for the community. So whilst I, I know and understand through in, in the, re, the, the initial relief um, there was some some barriers that were experienced. We've worked very quickly, um, both under the national coordination arrangements that are being led for, by the National Bushfire Recovery Agency, but also just through bilateral conversations and, and, and practical discussions with our counterparts in New South Wales, to make sure that you know, we've got community at the centre of, of, of what we're doing, rather than you know saying, well, you know, sorry, well, well, we know you know your major service centre might be Gingillic. Um, but, hey, we, we can't help you there. Now, it's just a, a, a practical approach that says, how do we best work with New South Wales to meet the needs of those communities? So, Mr Mises, you've spoken of working with New South Wales. Has that arrangement um, uh, been uh, formalised uh, in a framework or an agreement or a cross-border agreement or some, si some other sort of uh, uh, documentation of the arrangement? Uh, not, not from Bushfire Recovery um, Victoria's perspective. I mean, our focus very much has been on how do we get the, these programs moving quickly for, for communities. 
um, in, the, in the due course of time where, where there does need to be formalisation of these arrangements that we will put that in place. But right here and now, the lack of a formal agreement is certainly not providing any barrier um, to us working with uh, New South Wales in that, that bilateral uh, manner in which we are. Um, you say there there's not or there is not yet a formal national approach. What do you think the formal national approach should be? Um, it's probably not one that I, I haven't necessarily tur turned my mind um, significantly to, but, you know, where we have had, um, and, and Victoria participates, as do all other states and ju jurisdictions, in, in the, the national coordination forums, we have been able to share information um, to make sure that there is some consistency in programs that are being delivered under the disaster recovery funding arrangements. Um, th that has certainly worked. So um, those those national forums um, then do allow, you know, for, for information sharing, um, for learnings to be shared across multi jurisdictions, uh, uh, multiple jurisdictions. Sorry, I think that's that that would be uh, something that would be beneficial to continue. Can we go. To, thank you, Mr. Myers. Can we go to page thirty-three? Uh, question forty-three. Mm. Question 43 at the bottom. Thank you. Uh, you were asked by the Royal... Oh, sorry, the State of Victoria was asked by the Royal Commission to describe the key barriers the State of Victoria has encountered in delivering response and recovery support and any ways in which they could be reduced or overcome. Uh, the uh, State of Victoria has provided only preliminary observations. Do you know um, whether there is a plan to give the Royal Commission a definitive response to its questions? Uh, I think what we've identified here is, is the key ones that, that Bushfire Recovery Victoria ha has identified. Um, I, I personally am not aware whether there is any um, uh, intent to provide a, a, a different response than, than what you see here. All right. Could we go over to uh, the next page, uh, paragraph 191.3. Uh, you speak there about... Um, limited regional access to mobile communications and national broadband networks has limited the ability to deploy digital delivery alternatives uh, required to respond to the challenges posed by COVID-19. BREV has implemented digital kiosks in the hubs to assist with digital connectivity barriers. Now, you said in an earlier answer to a question of mine that, um, uh, or at least I, as I understood it, that people's ability to, part to actually visit those hubs will be impacted by restrictions um, because of the social distancing restrictions. Uh, you've said outreach programs are also in development. What are those outreach programs and what is their status? Yeah, so um, when, so if I can just, uh, a couple of points to make here. Um, you know, the communities that were impacted by these fires are often in quite remote locations. Mm -hmm. Um, and they do have connectivity issues. So, you know, simply as we're doing, sort of talking to one another over the line does not work in some of these communities. And, and for some of the people and, and demographics that we're working with, they're not necessarily comfortable or have not used these types of technologies before. So um, through our hubs, people can book in to, in, a, in a supported way to, to access um, you know, Skype, for example, or, or whatever it might be, to talk to a financial counsellor. And, and while they're in the hub, you know, if they want to Skype the grandkids in Sydney, then, you know, we've got the technology and the support there to, to help that happen. Um, in terms of outreach, what, what we mean there is, you know, going out to the more remote communities. So, so not every community has a hub, mm -hmm. but those hubs we operate as a... <laughs> Know, a hub and spoke model, um, if I can, where where you know the, the hub coordinators from those communities, and if I use the example of the, the hub at um, at Bright, um, you know the, our hub coordinator at Bright will, will visit and go up to Falls Creek um, again to have to meet one on one again comply, in compliance with all of the COVID nineteen restrictions, but to make sure that you know those services are delivered there, and there are, again a number of remote communities and. Now, our focus is we don't want anyone falling through the gaps. So, so whether it's you know supporting them to access services online or bringing those services to them in their communities, um, that's what we're doing. Uh, can we go up to the paragraph above this, which is one nine one point two? 
Um, Victoria, the State of Victoria has indicated in its response to the Royal Commission that the Commonwealth made announcements prior to state consultation and ahead of recovery planning and development of program guidelines um, and saying that this led to confusion and frustration. I've got two questions that emerge from this paragraph. The first is, what are the announcements that are referred to in this paragraph? So, so a good example here would be um, the, the $500,000 concessional loans. Uh, which were announced and because in Victoria it's Bendigo Bank is the delivery agency for those and, and Bendigo Bank as a bank has certain regulatory requirements. We, we had to do a lot of work in making sure that we could finalise those arrangements before the product could be made available. So um, in some cases, you know, even with some of the small business grants, um, the announcements were made um, and we still had to do the work to finalise the guidelines, finalise the delivery arrangements in Victoria, which, which left a, a bit of a lag. Now, the announcement creates an expectation almost that that, that product will be available straight away. And, and when it's not, um, you know, that, that has caused some, some angst in, in, in the community. I think you gave an answer earlier in which you said that um, uh, providing information early, even before plans are settled, can at least give some certainty to uh, a community, affected community members. How do you reconcile those two positions? Well, I, I think there's, in my, my earlier response I was talking to, talking about, um, you know, for example, in, in, in cleanup, um, you know, telling someone that their property will be you know, we, we, we hope to be there in the next four weeks as opposed to we hope to be there tomorrow. Um, when, when an announcement is made, um, so, so that provides some certainty in, in terms of scale. When an announcement is made um, around, you know, the, the access to particularly financial assistance and it's not available straight away, um, that, then that does does create some some issues, and I, I think um, you know that that's, that can be overcome, and perhaps it's nuancing in how those things are announced in terms of you know this is our intent, and you know in, in Victoria we expect this product to be available at this time, um, but in all cases that that wasn't done. Um, how could consultation be improved in the future? Um, look, I think there's a, a I, I think um, we have learnt very quickly from some of those issues that I just talked about. Um, and, and when we look at the more recent announcements around joint funding, um, there has been that good consultation with the, the National Bushfire Recovery Agency working with us on, on making sure that, you know, the, the programs um, that are being delivered nationally, and every state has slightly different arrangements, so I, I, I understand some of the, the complexity that, that the Commonwealth is dealing with here. But, you know, and I think that the, the, the M National Bushfire Recovery Agency has certainly acted very quickly to address those issues. The, the national forums that we participate in enable us now to work through those issues. So the uh, National Bushfire Recovery Agency, like BRV, uh, was also um, an initiative established uh, in early January, uh, um, like you. So um, my question is, is there value in having a permanent body that is ready to ready to roll, so to speak, um, whenever a disaster strikes? Um. I think we, we, we or, and Bushfire Recovery Victoria has certainly um, valued the, the ability to, to, to engage with a, a dedicated agency in the Commonwealth around this, this issue. Um, now, whether what that looks like um, in, the, in the future, I don't have a, a particular view, but the, the ability to have that, that dedicated um, uh, agency that we, we, we can talk to, we can troubleshoot with, and that does have that role um, in, in you know, really looking across all jurisdictions it, it is valuable. Um, I have two more questions, but I'm conscious of the time, Chair. Tell you what, let us have a... We'll give your precious voice a break, <laughs> and uh, the commission Commissioners <laughs> uh, have a, a couple of questions. My, my first question is a follow-on to that. You are BRV... Mr. Meisters, but the question is, will you evolve into all natural disasters as a standing uh, organisation, or are you just going to focus on bushfires into the future? So, at this point in time, we've been established as Bushfire Recovery Victoria, and our, our particular focus is, as you, you may expect, Commissioner, on, on the communities that were impacted in 
the 1920 bushfires. And I appreciate you um, don't want to dilute that right now. I'm just sort of looking yeah. to the to the future. Yeah. So I think pr pragmatically in, in building this organisation, I've had a view to um, developing the capability and capacity within the organisation to be able to respond to any recovery activity that government may ask us to, to do. So whilst we have um, a, a bushfire focus right, right now, as we thought about developing and building the agency, we have had an eye to, to what you know, what may come in the future and what, what government may ask us to do. And um, as I, I mentioned earlier, the Inspector General for Emergency Management in Victoria um, will look more broadly at recovery, and I'm sure that that would inform any of those subsequent decisions uh, around the broadening of the scope of, a, of bushfire recovery in Victoria. OK, thank you. In the, the question that we will send out this afternoon, it would help us if you were to highlight the, the issues uh, every time you stand up an agency like this, you can't hit the ground running straight away. There are things that you must do, and therefore there's an impact of that on when the recovery response can actually physically start. We'd be just interested in an observation there as well, because I think that will help inform our recommendations in the future on what happens more nationally uh, as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it, it, it has been a, a challenging almost... I can, building the plane and, and yeah. flying it at the same time. But that real benefit of a standing capability, I think, puts the state of Victoria in a, in a really good position going forward. Yeah, and I've seen that advertisement as well. It's a great uh, film clip. We build aeroplanes. OK, I've got one more question, then I'll go to Commissioner Bennett and Commissioner McIntosh. If we can have paragraph 17 of that document up, please. And you'll help us on the search here for definitive information, <coughs> Mr Mises. Uh, it's page four. Page four. Yep. Right there. OK, so SRG, uh, as a part of ANZEMC, as a policy uh, organisation, uh, trying to hunt them down a little bit is quite difficult at the moment uh, because they are an independent uh, advisory group to, uh, to ANZEMC. I understand Victoria has the chair of that group at the moment. Is that correct? Uh it may well do, Commissioner, that, that if the chair um, is in Victoria, it's not in Bushfire Recovery Victoria. Um, so it, it likely pre-existed us. Um, okay. So I would need to inquire. You, you're sort of heading down the answers I, I expected. But I, can I just ask, you may not be the right person then, but obviously because they're a recovery reference group how much interface do they have with you as a recovery bushfires recovery victoria uh i have not met uh with with the social recovery reference group um it's uh just described here um that that said um certainly we have had particular working groups that have been established and stood up around these fires, um, the 1920 fires, that is, that look across, you know, almost every uh, line of recovery, including including social recovery. So um, whilst there has been and pre-existing uh, and, and, and well-established forums that, that really look at a, at, a, at a policy level around some of these arrangements, our focus um, has very much been on on the practical, pragmatic delivery of, of services right now, and the arrangements that we need to put in place, working with our our counterparts to to make that happen as effectively as we can for communities. Okay, so the document there, guidelines for interstate assistance, community re recovery, 2018, provides. Uh, in fact, I don't believe that's the current document either, the new document, I think it's guidelines for interjurisdictional assistance, community recovery 2020, but um, regardless what the intent there is to set up a mechanism for <coughs> assistance between states. So I understand Victoria has helped other states uh, in the past under this framework. Has Victoria called on the, uh, the guidelines for assistance to Victoria in the 2019-2020 bushfire season? Uh, Commissioner, not not for recovery, not not formally. That that said, um, there's a lot of information sharing going uh, on across um, across jurisdictions, and, and um, you know where we're seeing something that, that works very well in in New South Wales. Then they've been very generous in, in providing us advice. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, so that we can get the same effectiveness. A, a good example of that would be, um, you know, the, the ten thousand dollar small business grants when they were initially announced. Um, we saw quite a significant and, and huge uptake in New South Wales relative to Victoria, and, and even accounting for. Uh, the, the difference in the size of the impact between the two states, it, it, it did not make sense to us. And, and certainly we work very closely with New South Wales and, and they supported us in understanding what they were doing differently to us. Um, that, that was resulting in such a, 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 a massive uptake. Um, okay. And, and you know, very quickly we were able to diagnose it was a simple online application form that, that Services New South Wales had rolled out that we were then um, able to learn from, replicate in Victoria. And as a result of that, we saw a significant increase in uptake. So whilst we haven't necessarily relied on, on formal guidelines for interstate assistance, we are all very much working together to make sure that collectively we can deliver the best outcomes for, for impacted communities. Okay, thank you for your answer. Commissioner Bennett. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Mises, I was intrigued, I must say, by the answer to the question um, about the, um, uh, uh, the ongoing Commonwealth agency responsible for recovery going forward. It said Victoria doesn't have a formal position on a standalone Commonwealth agency. Uh, do I take it that informally, though, that you, from what you've said, that you support it? Uh, I think uh, I would say in, informally uh, we have really benefited from having the, the, a dedicated agency for recovery that we have been able to work very closely with um, and that that has provided real benefits for, for Victorian communities. Um, Thank you. I think that you've, you've highlighted, I mean, through the course of this these answers, and I won't bother putting them up, there's been a highlight of a number of areas where um, I think there've been specific identification of uh, useful national um, frame. Well, I hate I hate the word framework. Frameworks. That's because it says it here. So one was a national monitoring and evaluation framework for disaster recovery programs, and you see that as a positive, I assume. Uh, yeah, I think um, the, the ability to have um, you know evaluation and lessons learned and, and mechanisms to do that at the national level. Uh, are really important. Wh whilst we as an organisation will have our own evaluation processes and our own lessons learned processes, being able to feed those into at, at the national level um, and to share those learnings and to ultimately, you know, as, as we all are, focus on delivering better outcomes you know, when a future disaster occurs, that, that's invaluable. And, and when I, I also picked up that you said you contribute to national level improvements. Do I take it um, it's not just a question when you said just now sharing, it's not just a question of contributing. If you see that um, a national framework offers something um, better that, than Victoria has individually implemented because of learnings from other jurisdictions, you would then um, take the view that that, where, that that was a useful matter for Victoria then to implement and perhaps alter or change its, its present arrangements. If you saw... Uh, it, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our focus, as I said, is, is you know, really on how do you get the best services and best support to communities. And, and you know, we're not parochial um, in terms of where we, we, we take those learnings from. Um, if something's working better in another state and we think it makes sense to implement that in Victoria, then yes, we will do that. And I think you've also um, highlighted that there should be, or it could, there could usefully be the for, uh, consistent guidelines on the preparation and sharing of impact assessment data across jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Again, um, being able to compare, if you like, apples and apples when we're looking at what the impacts are, um, is again would be would be useful and um, you know something that we think um, you know, we would we would value. Okay, thank you. Well, I just want to go a couple of little points coming arising in respect of that. You've said in one of your in one of the answers that um, that you're working with state departments and agencies to establish more streamlined data sharing. Are you also working to have streamlined data sharing with the Commonwealth? Yeah, we're, we're, it's probably fair to say that we're, we're starting with the state agencies um, and, and being able to, you know, we're, we're focused on developing a platform here in Victoria that state agencies can input data into that can be easily accessed and, re and reported on. Um, you know, a natural extension of that in my mind is into local government, into Commonwealth government and into non-government sector because there are, you know, there are a lot of um, participants uh, that, that 
are are active in supporting community recovery. Um, what we need to avoid is you know, an individual having to tell their story of trauma exactly. over and over again to yep. different actors. Yes, we've heard that um, a lot. Are you, we, uh, we've, we heard that a lot in the communities. Can I just ask you a question? Um, are you aware that the uh, NBRA has, has brought in a, a, um, a portal or a, a, a platform called Recovery Connect? Yes. Yes. Uh, is Victoria planning to utilise... I mean, you talk about the state agencies putting in models. It seems to me that seems to be a one-stop portal for information across... It's, it's anticipated to be across the country. Is Victoria... I mean, wouldn't that be something that Victoria could utilise um, an existing or a, an already developing um, Commonwealth framework and um, perhaps utilise that in order to go beyond uh, telling people... Well, starting off, as I understand it, telling people... Um, what uh, what um, programs might be available to their benefit during the course of, the, of recovery is is Victoria doing that, or planning to do that, or do you have plans uh, in place? So, in terms of communication of the programs that are available, um, we do that. We also point people to to, to the Commonwealth. Um, you know, I, again, as we've been establishing as a, as organisations. One of our principles has been there's no wrong door. So if you go to the Commonwealth, um, you can get information. If you come through a Victorian channel, you can get the, the same information. Moving well, forward... Why, why, why isn't that... It, what, that's a redundancy. I mean, if, if, if there's one that tells people across jurisdictions what's available, why have a second one giving it the same information? I'm sorry, I don't understand. So I think it's just been a function of new organisations standing up and wanting to make sure that the community can access information. As we move forward, we will look to leverage existing um, uh, systems and processes, absolutely. But there are also differences between, um, you know, as organisations and, and the, the data um, systems that I, I was we, we referred to in, 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 in this response really internal mani uh, management. Um, you know, we as a delivery agency need a particular um, level of information that um, is quite granular. Um, and, you know, we want to focus on and know uh, our optimal outcome is that we know at, at where an individual is at on their recovery journey. We want to know what access they've had to support. We want to know what they may not have accessed. We want to know what is the potential, the next obstacle or the next barrier that they're going to face? And we want to be able to proactively move those barriers out of the way for people. To do that, we need a good state-based information system. Now, in building that, absolutely, we will we'll leverage um, whatever it, what exists um, in, the, in the Commonwealth where it makes sense to do so. And I should say that the, the, the types of information that, that we've made available um, are really on our, our, our website. Um, we're not talking here about a significant investment that, that's been made. It's about practically um, understanding where people go for information and making that information available to them. OK, thank you. I have one other, one other question, um, and you, it was raised with you in the, in the concept of... Um, uh, I suppose, insurance and how people are dealt with. I mean, I understand the concept of needs-based, and I think most recovery programs refer again and again, and I think your, your response as well to it being needs-based. But I'm, I'm, I, I have a, a, a difficulty understanding that if people are getting um, uh, assistance purely on needs-based, um, where insurance and uh, individual uh, <coughs> steps to mitigate or, you know, spending money in order to mitigate um, possible uh, disaster effects, where that fits in to the concept of everyone just being given whatever they need on a needs base. So why would... If, if two people, one is insured and one's not insured and they both lose their house in a bushfire um, and they're getting the same um, recovery payouts at, of assistance, then where, where in, the, in the recovery program are you looking at the incentive for people to look after themselves and either spend money to mitigate or to insure? So I think it's, it's, it's a really important point that you make and, and the, the moral dilemma, if you like, about not disincentivising the, the uptake of insurance. And um, when we talk needs-based, you know, the, the, the needs and impacts in one local government area can be quite different to, a, to another and the, the impacts in one community can be quite different to another. I'm talking so within a community. Needs... Let's just talk about for a moment because that's where the, the examples are more um, 
are stronger yeah. within a community, two people side by side in the same street in the same community, um, impacted by the same fire, and one has insured and one hasn't. So if I could use a couple of examples of, of the services and supports that we're providing to those individuals. So state-based cleanup, um, it did not matter whether you were insured or, or not insured, you, are, you had access to that program. What we did is work very closely with the Insurance Council of Australia to make sure that you know, where people were insured, the benefits of the financial benefits of a state-based program um, were passed on to the policy holder. Um, so we did not um, differentiate between insured or not insured, but what we did want to make sure is that those that did take out insurance were the beneficiaries of a state-based program in terms of um, you know, the, the passing on of any savings that a, an insurance company might, might receive. No, sorry, um, can I interrupt you? Can I just stop for a second to, uh, to try and understand that? Um, what you're saying is you don't penalise someone for having had insurance, is basically that's that point, isn't it? That's correct, and okay. we do not want to disincentivise people taking up insurance going forward. Right, but if you're going to replace the home, rebuild the home, possibly with a betterment, um, a betterment provision, let's even leave that out, but if you're going to rebuild the home and the two homes are going to be rebuilt um, to, to the same standard by the state, then where's the incentive to insure? So the state is not, not rebuilding the homes. The state has been doing the clean-up of, of the, the damaged and destroyed buildings. Um, there is no current program in, in the Victorian government that would assist someone um, in uh, rebuilding their home. All the programs that, that we have, uh, sorry, in, in the actual construction of the home. So the programs that we have in place, um, clean-up would be one. Um, the, the assessment of bushfire attack levels um, they're done settlement wide. We're not discriminating again between um, insured or not insured in how we how we how we deliver those programs. Um, it's it's providing the assistance to those um, that have been impacted in a way that does not disincentivise people to take up insurance going forward. Yes, I'm not sure I understand how that works practically, but I'll leave it at that because of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Mr. Moses. Uh, you, in the submission, the, the Victorian government raises the importance of having a, a national protocol for impact data collection, a and I just wondered whether Victoria has its own protocol for collecting impact data. The reason I ask is we've received impact data in a wide variety of forms um, that is clearly inconsistent, and I just wondered whether your jurisdiction has a protocol to ensure that, at least within the jurisdiction, there is consistency. Uh, th there are some pro protocols uh, that, that are in place. Um, it, it is fair to say that, um, you know, as an organisation, we are so reliant on that impact data because it helps us understand the impacts and then shape the, the programs. Um, and. Uh, there are improvements that can be made to those protocols, and it's certainly something that, that we will look at, at going forward. But yes, that there, there are protocols, but you know, it, um, as can happen, um, and as you know, in some cases should happen, those protocols are applied in a particular circumstance and don't always deliver the outcome that you want or need. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, another one, you, you raised before the Small Business Bushfire Support Grant and how it had been extended to, uh, I think, four additional shires, Indigo, Mansfield, um, Wangaratta and Wellington shires. Could you explain to us um, why it was extended to, to those shires and why it was so late? What was special about then? Yeah, so uh, the initial uh, three local government areas um, that were included within the uh, Small Business Grant Program were amongst the 20 most impacted nationally. Um, that was 100% funded by the Commonwealth Government. And as I mentioned before, when that program rolled out, we did not see the level of uptake initially that we expected to in Victoria. Um, so pragmatically, we wanted to make sure that the system was, was working and, in fact, um, that the program was meeting the need before we looked at, at, at expansion. Um, where we did expand it, it went to the other three local government areas that were part of the start, State of Disaster Declaration in Victoria and Indigo Shire because some of the economic analysis that was done through um, Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions really showed that there was a, a particular 
uh, impact on, on small businesses within that local government area. Right, right, so they were indirectly affected rather than being directly affected? Yes, the, the $10,000 grants were really for indirectly affected businesses, yes. Yeah, right. So that uh, that raises questions about consistency across both jurisdictions, across events, um, across different types of businesses, I suppose, as well. Is is that a, a matter of concern for, 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 for you and for the Victorian Government, that ensuring consistent treatment at least in relation to Commonwealth funded programs, that there are there is consistency across jurisdiction across areas? So that there is consistency, Commissioner. So that the guidelines are consistent across jurisdictions. Um, it was up to the jurisdictions to make the decision about when or if that program was expanded beyond the original 20 local government areas that were funded wholly by the Commonwealth Government. But each jurisdiction, as I understand it, did make that decision, but they were made at different times. But the type, the nature of the program, the eligibility criteria are consistent across jurisdictions. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Mr Moses. Thanks, Chair. Ms hogan -Dora. Uh, one of my questions was dealt with, and I just uh -huh. have one small question, and then I have some updated information uh, okay. in terms of procedure. Uh, uh, Mr Mises, uh, um, page uh, 30 of the Victorian response, paragraph 167, deals with Victoria's Natural Disaster Financial Assistance Scheme, which is available to eligible undertakings to relieve some of the financial burden. As I understand it, the initial threshold to access that scheme is $100,000. What happens when that threshold is not met? Does, do, for example, local councils have to foot that bill up to that, in the absence of that assistance? Uh, this program is administered by Emergency Management Victoria um, and is not a question that, that I, I can respond to directly. Um, and is it, the reason, it is very much... Is the reason it's administered by Emergency Management Victoria is because the issue I'm asking about is minor disaster events and you're only responsible for bushfire and the most recent bushfire? Well, because... Yeah, uh, and a function again of, of newness um, of, of my organisation. Um, Emergency Management Victoria has uh, has been administering um, the trust and managing the trust, and as I said, continues to do so. Um, our focus again is on very much on the operational delivery. All right, we'll take that up with uh, Emergency Management Victoria. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mises. I don't have any additional questions. Mr. Mises, thank you this morning. Thank you for persevering with us as we head through the technical uh, issues that we've had. But we do appreciate your insight and how forthright you've been in looking to uh, what it's like to stand up an agency in the middle of a, of a, of a crisis. And, uh, and Mr Adderwell, do you have any questions, seeing as you're online? Or comments? No, I don't, Commissioner. Thank no, you. I don't, thank you. And thank you for your perseverance as well. We appreciate that. That's right. Thank you. Might Mr Mises be released from his... Mr Mises may be released from his summons. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, I'm looking at the activity going on back there. There is, Chair. I'm told that we should be back online after lunch, but not for the ACT. We're reaching out to the ACT legal representative to determine whether or not they have any issues about being uh, uh, proceeding in the same way as Victoria, yeah. subject, of course, to your position, Chair. OK, what we'll do, we'll adjourn to a, until a time to be advised and we'll sort this out offline on how we're going to proceed. Right. And I understand the... Uh, you know, we're in well into the hearings this is the first technical issue we've had like this so uh, I want to make sure we get it right as we uh, as we proceed so that we are fully transparent and the public can see the uh, the um, the proceedings right. so we'll adjourn until a time to be uh, decided right. and you. would that be um, uh, advised via website and the uh, video stream link correct thank you chair thank you all rise Commission has temporarily adjourned. Um, the Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated.
Ms Hogan Doran, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. I'll just provide um, an update and also some proposed procedural changes to okay. de deal with the balance of the witnesses. Um, we have now, I understand, re-established the live stream, uh, which we didn't have for the last witness. The um, evidence of Mr Lee Mises, who was the CEO of Bushfire Recovery Victoria, was uh, taken for those but now following on the live stream was taken received this morning uh, with the concurrence of the state of Victoria uh, that has been recorded that recording will be made available on the website later this evening uh, the transcript has been finalized and is in the process of being uploaded uh, to the website and should be available if not now any moment it was going on as we walked in <laughs> there we go yes. Uh, so that will be, uh, be available to everybody. Um, it is proposed that the uh, witnesses from the ACT and from Western Australia will be uh, taken by Ms Dovey this afternoon uh, and that the summonses issued to uh, Ms Prendergast and Mr Presland of uh, New South, State of New South Wales be adjourned to 1.30pm on Monday. Uh, the 13th of July, at which time the Commission would anticipate sitting for approximately one and a half to two hours. Okay, and that works. It's better than probably sitting at seven o'clock tonight for two hours. <laughs> so I think moving it to Monday uh, is a better time to be able to, to do that. Uh, and my apologies to the New South Wales witnesses there, uh, but I thank them for accommodating the So could just, if you could just formally order that those summonses be stood over? I order those summons be stood over till Monday. Uh, and I'll... Uh, um, tender from the third supplementary tender list uh, exhibits 21.1.1 which is the New South Wales supplementary response to the notice to give uh, dated 9 July 2020 which is a um, two page document uh, I also tender the uh, National Insurance Project final report for the Mitigation and Risk Subcommittee of Australia New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, dated 15 January 2020, which was provided um, in, by the State of New South Wales uh, accompanying that supplementary response. It is referred to in the New South Wales um, principal response uh, in answer to question 54. So those two documents for tender, Chair. OK, we'll take both those documents uh, as exhibits. And I think that's all by way of housekeeping. Thank you, Chair. Hey, Ms Dovey. Next up, and with a little bit of a delay, um, we have a witness from the Australian Capital Territory. I call Mr Bren Berkovic, Executive Branch Manager, Security and Emergency Management Branch of the Australian Capital Territory. Mr Berkovic, thank you for joining us. Uh, apologies again for delaying you and uh, appreciate your, your patience. Um, and Mr Berkovic will... Mr Berkovic, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Berkovic, First up, I'd like to turn to the effect on the Australian Capital Territory of the recent bushfire season. We're all aware, I think, of the bushfires that came through Canberra in 2003. But in terms of the most recent season, if we could please go to the ACT's response to the notice at ACT 500 001 0001 at page 0043. I think this is a map of the Auroral Valley fire, is that right? That's correct. It's a, a map of the fire. Uh, the final footprint, uh, it, is, it was extinguished. Yeah. Can you please uh, tell the commissioners a bit about the effect of that fire on the Australian Capital Territory, um, and in particular the indirect effect on people within Canberra? 
Thank you, and I acknowledge the Commission's work and interest in this matter, and in particular recovery. Uh, the fire, and I'd like to start by essentially the uh, impacts of the fire prior to the ignition of the Aurora. So the smoke from the New South Wales fire significantly impacted the ACT from January. Uh, there was high levels of uh, hazardous smoke across the ACT for several weeks, uh, which preceded the ignition of the Aurora Valley fire. I think uh, starting with the original in, uh, impact of the smoke, there was uh, impact indirect of that prior, uh, prior to the fire on businesses in the ACT and a lot of uh, businesses and other activities undertaken outdoors. Obviously, it was uh, too difficult to undertake in many cases activities uh, and business uh, outdoors. After the impact of the Aurora uh, Valley fire, we saw uh, again uh, concern on the Canberra community and uh, the uh, recollection of events of 2003, which obviously um, uh, are still uh, significant to those living in the affected areas. Again, the fire was uh, had a significant impact to the ACT on the, on the again business impact and again has rendered significant areas of the Namaji National Park unusable uh, for a considerable uh, period of time. So a combination of both uh, fire impact and smoke impact uh, indirectly on a lot of businesses and the Canberra community. When you refer to the effect particularly on people who experienced the 2003 bushfires, uh, can you explain a little bit more about why there's a particular effect there? The 2003 uh, bushfires was a significant national disaster in the ACT. Uh, it impacted over 500, uh, destroyed over 500 houses along the uh, western uh, perimeter of the uh, Canberra urban edge. Uh, memories of Canberrans, uh, for those still living in the ACT, will remember that day. It was a significant uh, disaster uh, impacting many, including uh, several loss of lives. So uh, even after a period of time has passed, uh, any significant fire, particularly to the west of the ACT or in the rural areas of the ACT, uh, still has the potential to cause uh, considerable uh, concern to those that were living in the ACT in 2003. And did the, in this most recent season, the ACT set up, um, I, I think it's two relief centres, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and a, a relief centre was uh, established in January, in early January, in response to the events of New South Wales. That was deemed necessary due to the high number of interstate people that were uh, evacuating or on the move from their uh, places interstate, New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, as presented in the in the notice to give, there was uh, several hundred people that passed through that relief centre at the Dixon College and that uh, is in accordance with the ACT's uh, uh, recovery arrangements, the, that facility. Yeah. Um, the Aurora Valley bushfire, um, at page 0017, it set out that it burnt 87,923 hectares, so almost 88,000 hectares. Um, are you able to describe the damage, particularly to the Namaji National Park, that was caused? Yes, I could certainly uh, touch on, on that. I'll, I will highlight that's not my area of expertise in terms of the environmental impact, uh, but I can certainly touch on uh, the, uh, the key areas of impact. Namaji National Park is an area of significant natural, cultural uh, and heritage value to the ACT. It's uh, part of the ACT's uh, water catchment. Uh, it was significantly impacted uh, during the 2003 bushfires, and this bushfire has uh, burnt uh, from, uh, uh, over 80,000 hectares of the park, uh, causing significant damage. So several items of heritage value uh, were lost. Uh, there was, uh, there's been impact on quite a few of the uh, recreational areas that uh, the Canberra community can use, uh, and uh, of course, significant damage to uh, the um, uh, trees and wildlife and uh, sensitive areas uh, that uh, were closely monitored and prepared uh, prior to the arrival of the bush bushfire. So as much work was done was to protect those areas, but significant area of the parks was uh, significantly uh, damaged, uh, including uh, the loss of um, countless wildlife. And is the damage that was caused, are you, is that something for which you're able to obtain 
Commonwealth funding to remediate that damage? The ACT is still in discussions with uh, the Commonwealth in terms of uh, the uh, uh, arrangements for that fire. Uh, under the disaster recovery uh, funding arrangements that uh, I have responsibility for coordinating in the ACT, uh, there is uh, the environment is uh, not currently recognised as an area under the DFRA uh, that allows a uh, cooperative uh, approach to recovery. So it is a significant gap for the ACT at the moment in, in pursuing uh, funding under the DFRA to replace uh, areas or to, re to recover the uh, environmental needs of Namanji National Park, which is beyond uh, the immediate community effects, is the highest priority for the ACT. Yeah. Now, this isn't mentioned in your response, so I, I don't know whether you can speak to it, but I don't believe that Jarvis Bay comes up in the description of what happened in the fires. And I was just wondering if you're able to speak to whether the fires affected Jarvis Bay and whether that fits within your or the, the Australian Capital Territory's um, recovery obligations when there's a disaster. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm not able to talk to recovery. I'm not aware of the recovery arrangements for that uh, for the uh, community there in New, uh, in uh, Jarvis Bay. Do you know who is responsible? No, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I believe New South Wales uh, has a role, but it is a Commonwealth territory. So yeah, I'm not uh, can't talk any further in terms of the recovery uh, priorities for Jarvis Bay or who undertakes it. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on to recovery coordination. Um, before I ask you more generally about how recovery happens within the Territory, can I ask you to briefly explain your role as it relates to recovery from natural disasters? Sure. So the, uh, the ACT has a tiered approach to recovery. Uh, at the strategic level, of course, the, the ACT government uh, has strategic leadership and responsibility for recovery uh, matters. Uh, similar to what we're seeing now as part of the uh, response to COVID. At a uh, officials level, the ACT's uh, equivalent State Crisis Committee, uh, SEMSOG, Security Emergency Management Senior Officials Group, has strategic coordination across uh, all of the ACT government in terms of re recovery. Uh, my role as the Executive Branch Manager for Security Emergency Management Branch is to chair the ACT Recovery Committee which coordinates recovery uh, policy development and coordination uh, in response to natural disaster matters in the ACT. So it's very much a tiered approach depending on the uh, level of decision making or coordination requirement. You mentioned earlier that people were, you set up a relief centre for people coming from New South Wales fires. When you're looking at coordination of recovery within the ACT, is support being offered to people from outside the territory part of the normal planning um, processes? Is that something that you take into account? Uh, abso absolutely. I think uh, wherever there's a community in need, it is important that that be factored into the planning. Uh, as highlighted in, in evidence uh, provided, there was um, some discussions occurred early with the Australian Government about activating the DFRA for that matter. And the uh, DFRA policy does not uh, contain provisions for uh, uh, activating a DFR in one state where uh, the natural disaster is occurring in another state. Irrespective of that uh, uh, policy issue, the ACT did activate the, the relief centre, uh, which was uh, proved to be uh, highly valued by those passing through and as, as evidence highlighted uh, significant levels of emergency accommodation, relief, uh, counselling uh, and other support provided to those passing through. So I think if we can go to page 0021. Um, this in the second paragraph on the page, just so we can highlight, you've drawn out that there were significant numbers of people who came in from the New South Wales South Coast Snowy Mountains, as well as people from the ACT. Um, can I That's correct, if I can draw out a Yep specific example of, um, there was actually a report when the, the recovery centre after it was initially opened in the, for the first 24 hours, uh, it, the time was scaled back and I, from memory it opened at seven or eight in the morning. A report came in from the Dixon centre that somebody had driven through the night and uh, from Victoria and parked their car uh, there and slept in their car overnight. Uh, just simply they, they realised uh, that they could seek assistance and so they drove throughout the night and were sleeping in their car. 
So from as far away as Victoria. Correct. Can I ask you to describe the interaction with the Commonwealth um, that you have in relation to recovery support, both both planning and uh, getting funding in respect of specific support provided? The majority of uh, coordination and policy development with the Australian Government occurs through the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management Committee, ANZMC, uh, and there's a subcommittee uh, uh, as part of NZMC, the Community Outcomes and Recovery Subcommittee, CORES, uh, which has a significant focus on national coordination of, of recovery matters. There's also a, a DFRA a stakeholders group. Now, that generally meets uh, twice yearly, uh, depending on the needs, and uh, progresses uh, work around DFRA matters. So there's uh, uh, ongoing uh, contact around uh, the DFRA as well as uh, three monthly reporting of whether there has been any uh, natural disasters occur in the state or territory. Certainly. And with the introduction this year of the NBRA, has that been of assistance to the ACT? Uh, from my experience on several of the uh, working groups uh, set up, I, I view it has been um, of, of benefit. I think there has been some early challenges at working out the re responsibilities between Emergency Management Australia and the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. But I think any any effort, um, particularly on a, at a national level, to bring uh, states and territories and the Australian government together to talk about and discuss and prioritise recovery, recovery matters, recovery policy, has been of benefit. And it's highlighted in evidence the ACT did see that the uh, development of uh, three uh, and, and more grant programs was useful and uh, in some aspects uh, delay, uh, reduced delays that might be encountered to people being ac uh, able to access grants and loan programs, particularly from states and territories that don't normally have a significant need for those sort of programs. Yeah. You say, or the, the response says at uh, page 0006, that the ACT has various MOUs in place with New South Wales to request interstate resources such as SES, RFS, ambulance. Is that also true for longer term recovery type resources or is, is, it, is it really limited to that sort of response and relief phase? Uh, the, the primary uh, MOUs for those agencies that possess them is around that immediate uh, response and immediate relief. Uh, for longer term recoveries, I'm only aware of the one uh, MOU as presented in evidence which relates to social uh, recovery and the ability for states and territories uh, to work together to uh, provide uh, support around social uh, recovery matters. And as is highlighted, that was last uh, activated during the uh, Queensland floods so the tropical cyclone. And what you're referring to there is the Social Recovery Reference Group Guidelines for Interjurisdictional Assistance, is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Certainly. And um, 20 staff from the ACT were deployed up to Townsville in the floods in 2019? Yeah, that's correct. It's an area for uh, the ACT as a, as a well-planned, generally significant natural disaster-free uh, territory. Uh, it's, it's an area that the ACT does get uh, considerable benefit and experience from, from being able to support other states and territories in their recovery needs. So uh, from the deployments uh, that the ACT has undertaken in the past, uh, the, the feedback is as they've proved to be very, very useful in developing the capability and experience of uh, ACT officials undertaking recovery duties. Yeah. Do you, were you personally involved with the process of that deployment under those guidelines? No, they're, uh, they're undertaken in a separate directory in community, community services directorate. And so a separate agency uh, undertakes that. I do have a number of staff, however, in my branch that have uh, been trained to undertake that function and that were deployed uh, to Townsville during during that incident. And, and again, the feedback was that they found it most useful and beneficial um, and enlightening to be engaging with a disaster affected community and doing their absolute best to uh, navigate the complexities of administration and recovery matters to provide support. Yeah. Operationally, in terms of the use of those guidelines, is it a state-to-state -state communication that initiates that support going from one state to another? Or does the Social Recovery Reference Group play an, an operational role in facilitating the deployment? 
Uh, my understanding in, in reading the, the guidelines, and again, I'll highlight that those guidelines are, uh, or that MOU are uh, managed by Community Services Directorate, uh, uh, directorate outside the one I'm with. Um, but my understanding in reading the guidelines is that there, there is a considerable degree of facilitation between uh, officials that uh, the, the Social Recovery Re Reference Group, the SRRG, um, that initially coordinate and uh, call upon assistance from other states and territories, and then it obviously goes through the more formal mechanisms to, to request that help. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, just one moment. Moving on to co coordination with community partners, if we can please go to at the bottom of page 0006, over to... Did they use that at all during the last fire season? Did they trigger it during the last fire season? Did they trigger those guidelines in the last fire season? The interjurisdictional ones. Um, the interjurisdictional guidelines that we were just talking about from the SRRG, do you know if they were triggered? Does ACT send anyone to assist during the most recent bushfires? Or bring them in. Or, or bring anyone in to assist? I'm not, I'm not aware um, that they were triggered for the, for the bushfires. Okay, thank you very much. Um, turning to the, the Memorandum of Understanding for Social Recovery Cooperation between Community Services Directorate and Community Functional Partners, as shown there, and then <coughs> over the page, um, can you please speak to the, describe how that agreement came about um, and the way in which it operates? And perhaps while you're speaking to that, we can pull up the document itself, um, which is at page 0140 to 0141. Sure, thank you. And uh, certainly can I acknowledge all the wonderful community organisations that have supported and undertaking critical duties during uh, during the uh, uh, bushfire emergency, it was a, it was a significant um, significant response by those community organisations that give tirelessly. Uh, in the ACT, that that MOU has been a, a significant success and and is very very important in terms of the ACT's uh, emergency management arrangements and and recovery arrangements. So it provides a a formal mechanism, not legally binding, of course, but to bring together. Uh, jurisdictions uh, and or community organisations, uh, government, non-government, um, to form a collective understanding of, of how to respond in, in an emergency. Uh, the agencies that are listed in that MOU uh, play a critical role in the ACT's response and recovery efforts, uh, particularly in the act, uh, activation of a relief centre or an evacuation centre, depending on the on the needs. And they were they were activated during uh, the bushfires of, of January, uh, initially at the Dixon Relief Centre and then subsequently at the Arendelle uh, Recovery Centre after the Aurora uh, Valley fire. Um, so uh, those organisations, uh, they meet regularly, so there is a committee uh, that, that meets and reports up to the uh, Recovery Committee, ACT's Recovery Committee, so there is a, a formal engagement regularly to ensure that there is a current uh, readiness and, and policy understanding, particularly ahead of um, the, the summer months. Uh, and finally, um, I think there is there is a mechanism for those agencies to, to recover costs uh, from the government should they be activated. Uh, and we do undertake uh, regular exercises, uh, in, uh, not only in response to natural disasters. Um, some recent events that have been, that have triggered that, those organisations have been uh, uh, terrorist-related exercise and simulations, and again, uh, providing providing those organisations uh, to to test and exercise their capabilities, which were during January uh, proved to be very very successful. Um, and, and as we can see here in Schedule C to the to the document, it, it provides a very clear outline of what each of these partners' role would be when when something is set up, and so everyone knows how they fit into the puzzle. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. So uh, all the all the different agencies there uh, have a, have their roles and responsibilities outlined in the document. And again, so there is no confusion or understanding when when they're called upon what's required. So again, that that's proved very very effective for the ACT to have these organisations uh, 
uh, ready and available uh, to respond to whatever the uh, event emergency is and provide the support um, as indicated in the document. Including, I, I note at the very end there on the right hand side, the volunteering and contact ACT is tasked with, amongst other things, matching and referring volunteers to other community functional partners and other organisations. That's correct. Volunteering and Contact ACT is a, a community organisation. Uh, they pr uh, play a key role in, in lining people uh, that are interested in, in volunteering uh, with uh, other volunteer organisations and they, they help facilitate uh, during emergencies that, uh, that provision of assistance which unless done well can quite quickly become out of control and disorganise and cause uh, uh, frustration. So I do recognise the work of volunteering and contact ACT in, in supporting emergency management and recovery arrangements. Can we please go to page 0008? Now, one of the one of the matters that was described as um, can we just um, under the heading loan and grant administration resource sharing. One of the challenges that you've identified for the ACT. Um, is in relation to administration support around funding. Can you please speak to this development and the interaction that you've had with QRider? Sure, and I'll certainly uh, recognise that this uh, has been uh, quite a successful outcome. Again, has helped to uh, reduce any unnecessary delay in the delivery of uh, recovery support funding to affected communities. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, the ACT is a, is a well-planned, uh, safe, safe city that uh, that uh, is generally free from the significant natural disasters that we we typically see in uh, regularly in other other states and territories. So over time, there hasn't been a, a critical need to invest in in expensive technology or systems that provide uh, uh, grant and loan management requirements. That is a, a labour intensive, difficult uh, uh, role and, and system that requires significant effort. After the activation of the Category B uh, loans under the DFRA, uh, there, was, there was a view uh, that uh, would be better served and, and faster by uh, collaborating with another agency and engaging another agency that's got far uh, more experience, expertise and systems uh, than, than the ACT maintains by default. So discussions with QRider led to a, an agreement that QRider would uh, develop the uh, and deliver the Category B loans on behalf of the ACT. Uh, that required some minor administrative uh, changes to existing forms that were already ready to go uh, that uh, QRider were using. And uh, as a result, uh, three uh, three businesses were uh, successful in their loan applications uh, through the QRider process and that occurred in a, in a matter of weeks and uh, certainly recognised QRider's uh, support and standing capabilities which the ACT views as is probably an opportunity moving forward uh, that rather than duplicating uh, all states and territories particularly those that uh, are smaller and, and don't have uh, potentially don't have as much experience or capability to maintain those systems that there is a significant opportunity to, to collaborate uh, particularly around um, uh, uh, there might be the opportunity to use uh, systems and capability of the Australian government which uh, which is obviously well uh, well developed you've referred there to the potential use of existing systems of services Australia did you have a particular form of funding that that would be used for in mind in that suggestion? I think certainly the allocation of, of grants is an area worth uh, worth exploring. So one off one off grants uh, during during disasters might be an area that the the ACT may wish to pursue. I think uh, you know grant management is uh, is a challenging uh, uh, labour intensive process. And having having access to existing systems or capability that can expedite those uh, grants and loan systems uh, or payment processes where eligible would be would be beneficial to uh, the faster delivery of recovery services. So I think uh, there is certainly an opportunity to revisit uh, and, and review how uh, how grants and loans are managed nationally and whether there is opportunity for uh, improved collaboration between states and territories and the Australian government to expedite those uh, those payments. And is that something in respect of which the ACT has engaged in negotiations or communications with the Commonwealth or QRider in terms of an ongoing access to those sorts of assistance? Mm -hmm. 
I think any long-term decision to engage uh, another jurisdiction to assist or the Australian government is obviously a, a matter for decision by, by the ACT government. However, there has been some uh, preliminary discussions and, and uh, review of, of options, and certainly it, it does appear that it may be in the ACT's interest to explore uh, these grants and loans, noting the general infrequency of which these uh, recovery grants and loans are activated. Uh, versus the, the cost to maintain the, the corporate knowledge and systems and, and having them ready to go. That may be better placed by having someone that uses them far more regularly, um, delivering on the ACT, uh, ACT's behalf, should, uh, should the government determine that uh, that policy decision would be the best option. And how did the use of QRider come up? Was it something where the ACT went to QRider and asked? Did QRider offer its help? Uh, I think it was one of those uh, very productive discussions that are, uh, that occurred uh, through the Community Out um, Outcomes and Recovery Subcommittee, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I was talking to my counterpart in, in Queensland about some of the challenges that uh, we viewed, we had, the ACT had, around the delivery of, of grants once they had been activated. Uh, and my colleague in Queensland kindly recommended that QRider may be able to assist uh, with that matter. That led on to subsequent uh, discussions uh, and the agreement. So I think it is a, is a good news story in terms of collaboration that's led to uh, a, a, an improved outcome for a disaster affected community. Yeah, thank you. So I thank my, I thank my colleague in that regard. <laughs> yes. Um, another challenge that you've addressed um, at page 0009 of the response, um, in the third paragraph down, is that um, the ACT, um, oh, my apologies, it must, it, can we bring up all, the, all of par paragraph eight, the top three? Um, that the ACT doesn't have formalised monitoring and evaluation arrangements for recovery programs. Um, you've noticed that, you've noted the availability of the monitoring and evaluation framework, the national one. Um, but you've said that retaining understanding and the ability to implement this complex document remains a challenge. Would you like to speak to the challenges in your jurisdiction of having that framework? That's a complex. Uh, thank you. Um, the the uh, monitoring and evaluation framework uh, I first uh, gained a knowledge of several years ago um, through an Australian government coordinated body to uh, in the training of uh, people uh, nationally and the exposure to that. Uh, I think there has been uh, limited ongoing focus on the monitoring and evaluation framework and, and particularly within a small uh, jurisdiction such as the ACT where it is used very, very infrequently. Uh, it is quite a complex document uh, can, and can uh, maintaining describe... corporate knowledge to do it. Sorry, can you describe for us the ways in which it's complex? Uh, I think the, it was, it, it's an academic uh, document. Uh, and I think the, from my understanding, designing uh, the, or, or, or maintaining an understanding, particularly when it's used so infrequently, um, is is very, very challenging. So it's a, quite a robust, sophisticated uh, document of, of academic standard. But of course, when you've got uh, people that are, are using it uh, very, very infrequently, uh, it can be it can be quite a challenge to maintain corporate knowledge. But I think there is there is opportunity to look at how that document is is framed and other other ways to uh, undertake monitoring and evaluation uh, and i suppose that's formal of course that's a, f a formal process um, the most uh, sometimes the most effective forms of monitoring and evaluation is by talking to disaster affected communities and getting their feedback and that's something the ACT government has placed uh, a high degree of, of focus on by uh, receiving feedback from those businesses and, and disaster affected communities and of course um, uh, receiving and responding to their needs directly. Yeah. Can I turn back to, we discussed the, the issue with smoke that happened during this bushfire season um, and, and I think we can all acknowledge Canberra was a hard hit and we saw the news um, reports around that. Can we go to page 0018? We discussed the effects of the smoke. Can you just discuss in a little bit more detail um, the situation in terms of any recovery support for businesses that suffered economic impacts as a result of that smoke disruption? Mm. 
So the 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 smoke was uh, the smoke was uh, significant for. Uh, weeks on end in the ACT and across Canberra uh, had significant impact on the uh, on business activity as, as is mentioned there in the in the evidence uh, as uh, many many shops uh, outdoor businesses childcare centers simply it was just too hazardous to undertake uh, outdoor outdoor activities and as a result they suffered uh, a loss of a loss of income. Now, the, in response to this, the economic development area within uh, within the ACT government uh, established links uh, to to those businesses and any, any uh, anyone seeking support as a result of the, the smoke in, impacts um, and discussed options not only through the ACT but um, other options uh, to provide economic and other uh, support that was available from the smoke. Um, I also could mention that the Category B uh, grants and loans uh, provide, uh, provides uh, options as well uh, for businesses that did uh, experience challenges during that time to, to apply for uh, funding, concessional loans as well, um, to assist with their uh, economic impacts. Have the majority of businesses that suffered that impact, they, they haven't received any funding support to date, have they? Uh, what, what I say is that all of those businesses that have applied for economic relief uh, through the Category B loans have been successful. Okay. Uh, and, uh, of course, the, the policy guidelines were broadened uh, for those loans to take into account uh, the, co the impacts of COVID as well. Uh, there and is work going on at the moment. Do you know how many... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, do you know how many businesses have applied and been successful? Uh, from evidence uh, there, it was it's three businesses that have applied, taken the opportunity, and, and from memory, the, the total loan uh, provisions as a result were uh, over 600,000, uh, and there's one one business that has applied for a grant uh, under under Category C, but that was as a result of direct bushfire impact. Yeah. Okay. You've mentioned in... And there are still, there are still opportunities to, uh, obviously, uh, there are still opportunities for businesses to, to uh, apply those uh, that, that uh, has not closed. Yeah. You've mentioned a number of times in your response that um, the ACT is fully self-insured and therefore is not able to access the Build Back Better provisions of the DRFA. Can you please explain that situation in what respect the self-insurance means that there's no ability to access that part of the DRFA? So it's an interesting, interesting uh, uh, policy conundrum of the DFRA. So under under the DFRA, uh, the activation particularly impacts on on category category C. Uh, any uh, repair of essential public infrastructure has uh, build back better provisions uh, within it. Uh, the ACT is a fully self-insured. Uh, Territory and uh, as a result, uh, probably is unlikely to access uh, the Category B provisions of the of the DFRA. Now, this may mean that the ACT is limited in being able to access uh, the Build Back Better provisions of the of the DFRA. So, as a res as a result of its self insurance, there could be limited opportunity for the Australian government and the ACT to work together to identify areas to improve bushfire resilience, particularly in, in for example, uh, the Magic National Park, to, to recover that uh, park to be more resilient to bushfire and to recover more quickly in the future. So that does appear to be a, a policy issue within the DFRA that for the ACT's own self-insurance arrangements, it's then precluded from being ab able to access uh, the Build Back Better provisions. Okay, thank you. Can we please go to 0008? And under the heading small disaster criteria in the disaster recovery funding arrangements, you raise here the effect of a hard threshold in the DRFA. Can you please explain the effect of this on the ACT by comparison with other jurisdictions? Uh, thank you. The, the small disaster criteria in, in the DFRA is a, is a set financial threshold that you that states and territories must exceed before the DFRA uh, can be activated. Uh, in a small jurisdiction such as the ACT, it can sometimes take uh, weeks 
uh, or days or weeks to determine uh, whether the the DFRA that threshold has been has been met. So as a re as a result, uh, the, the ACT adopts a cautious approach for, before activating the DFRA. Uh, our experience, uh, I think, over recent years is that 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 uh, small disaster criterion could therefore be. Uh, uh, an unnecessary barrier to activating the, or requesting to activate the DFRA with confidence. Uh, so, the the in, in terms of the initial smoke, uh, as I mentioned before, there was no provision for the ACT to activate the DFRA. <coughs> Pardon me. And after that, there there was that query of whether the ACT had uh, had reached its threshold once uh, once the evacuation relief centres were activated at Dixon. Uh, there was then um, uh, that uh, uh, query of whether the ACT had reached the uh, the threshold to activate. So it, it, I think our experience over the over the bushfires would indicate that uh, that small disaster criterion may be uh, potentially a barrier, particularly to small jurisdictions, to uh, to activating the DFRA with confidence and quickly. Yeah. Over the page to triple zero nine. Um, the second, sorry, the first dot point under question nine. You've referred to the opinion that there's likely to be benefit to either maintain the NBRA covering all hazards or bolster the resources within EMA. Can you speak to the benefit that you see to the ACT of having a body such as that? And please also talk about um, why you consider it's important that it not be limited to natural disasters, but that it should cover all hazards? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think um, maybe starting with the, the last question first, I think there should always be uh, a, well, a, a expect a expectation by the public, by the community, that irrespective of the, nat of the type of disaster, whether it be terrorism, uh, bushfire, hail, smoke, COVID, that all governments are able to, to respond uh, quickly in terms of, of recovery effort. Uh, and so that, that should be uh, consistent. Uh, I think there is, uh, from our experience, there was uh, quite a degree of benefit of, of the work undertaken by the National Bushfire Recovery Agency, obviously uh, stood up quite quickly uh, from, from uh, zero to help, help coordinate matters. Uh, we certainly view that uh, there was a lot of good work done, particularly around um, the, the development of the guidelines to support the nationally consistent grant and loan programs. Um, and so an agency that continues to that work and embeds it and most importantly maintains it uh, uh, prior to future uh, events will be very, very important that we don't let all the good work that's been done to establish uh, grants and loans programs and all the associated guidelines that go with it uh, slowly fade away. Um, so I think I think there is certainly a role for for an ongoing body, uh, whether it is a separate agency or whether it's embedded into uh, Emergency Management Australia, uh, would be helpful. Uh, I think there there has been some unique challenges between Emergency Management Australia as the policy arm for the DFRA versus the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. I, I think it's important that moving forward there will be there is a a, a one stop shop, whatever it is, that has all all recovery policy and um, associated matters. Uh, so the yeah the grants uh, the grants and loans uh, again the ACT maintains a, a, a small number of uh, relief guidelines, which uh, which we look for opportunities to to expand and and certainly our experiences over the over the past summer have identified some further opportunities to invest in expanding those guidelines. Uh, and to work on a, a national, potentially a national set of uh, grants and loans programs that uh, that can be potentially customised to the individual um, needs of the state and territory as well. So they, whilst whilst they can be consistent, there is a need to ensure that their their community fit is is appropriate. And so there does need to be a degree of flexibility, which we have. Uh, which the ACT is still working to achieve with uh, a $10,000 uh, small business uh, grant as well. Okay. I'm going to ask the commissioners if they have any questions for you. No, it's been very comprehensive. You've asked all the questions <laughs> I, I had. Uh, Commissioner Bennett. Um, I only have one. You, you raised some matters about the uh, monitoring and evaluation framework and some of the difficulties arising with that. Um, uh, 
are you aware of whether or not there is at the moment a a, um, a re-evaluation or there is work being done by the N, uh, NDRA or, or um, EMA as to re-examining um, the potential for the next round? I mean, to, to look again at criteria, pre-planning for disasters, so that um, uh, this would also deal with one of your other aspects, um, a pre-planning arrangement so that uh, things can be ready to go much more than they were this time? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I, I think uh, I'm not aware of any immediate review of the monitoring and evaluation framework. I, th I think the fact that um, as a result of the bushfires, we saw quite a, quite a degree of things that were waived to activate the grants and loans probably shows that they're, they're not in the best interests of, of the timely delivery of recovery services. Um, and uh, uh, so I think th I'm not aware of any immediate work happening, but certainly I think to come up with a, a monitoring and evaluation uh, process that is is standing relatively easy to use, I think would, would certainly be of, of assistance. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Berkovitz. Um, you just mentioned a $10,000 small business grant. I, I, you're referring there to the Commonwealth's um, Small Business Bushfire Recovery Grant? Uh, that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, the ACT uh, continues to uh, discuss with the Commonwealth uh, a, a means that that can be activated to, uh, to apply to the primary producers in the ACT. An issue that we've identified is the, the primary producers, which are, are rural leaseholders, and there's a very, very small number of them, are likely to fall through the eligibility criteria. So they're not generating over 50% of their income um, from, uh, from primary producer activities. Uh, they're also unlikely to be eligible for the small business, the $50,000 grant, as uh, that grant precludes the use of that funding for, uh, for farming activities. So as a, as a means to avoid uh, that community and who, who, who did suffer bushfire impact on their properties, uh, to avoid them falling through the, the cracks, uh, we continue to talk to the Australian Government about looking at means to uh, apply the $10,000 grant on a uh, restricted area basis. So just and so that would provide them with a, with a lower, lower threshold uh, and different uh, standards of eligibility to apply. Right, and, and just for my purposes, does the um, the small business, the ten thousand dollar grant program, is that confined to primary producers, or does that apply to non-primary producers? I, my interest is, I'm I'm curious as to why there weren't more small businesses in the ACT that put up their hands for grant assistance as opposed to loan assistance, and, and then you know why they haven't been extended the sort of help that is, I think, in Indigo they've mentioned to us that small businesses there have have accessed it. Mm. The, the an initial activation was the $75,000 and $50,000 primary producer and small business uh, grants, uh, as well as the concessional loan. So uh, uh, both the ACT and the Australian Government remain in discussion about the best way to activate the uh, $10,000 uh, small business grant that uh, provides uh, necessarily to, uh, relief to those that need it, in particular those that uh, did suffer uh, bushfire impact on their properties and, and suffer damage as well. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, oh, we one other, just quickly if I might. Um, uh, sorry, I should have been prepared for that. Um, uh, on, uh, on page seven, you mentioned that in 2019, the ACT deployed a team of 20 social recovery staff to assist Queensland. Is there... I'm curious in that just because it seems funny for a small jurisdiction like the ACT to lend resources to a large jurisdiction like Queensland. Was, was that part of staff training? You know, how, how did that come about? As, uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner. As, as discussed earlier, so that, that mechanism is provided for under the uh, MOU that's uh, as attached to the evidence of the ACT. It provides a means for any state or territory that is, is uh, requiring additional resources to, to support recovery needs, noting the expertise that is required uh, that can call upon other, other states and territories. Perhaps, thankfully, the ACT uh, being mainly disaster free uh, is in a very, very good position to support uh, other states and territories with, with not only their response but relief and recovery needs. 
Um, so as a result of the, the Queensland, that significant in incident up there, there was, a, a, I understand, a national uh, request for assistance and the ACT as part of that uh, sent, uh, sent staff that are trained uh, to undertake recovery duties up to Queensland. And as I mentioned earlier, that, uh, that experience uh, and the lessons learned that those staff uh, brought back uh, would be very, very unlikely to be experienced in the ACT. So uh, certainly the ACT views that is a, a very, very effective means for national collaboration around uh, recovery assistance and, and, and provides a means to develop capability within those jurisdictions that don't have to undertake that activity uh, frequently. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Thanks for your evidence too. Thanks, Chair. I just have uh, two two quick questions by yes, way of clarification arising out of those. Um, first, in relation to the question of evaluation and monitoring, I just wanted to clarify, is there any external evaluation process or body that the ACT uses or has used in the past to evaluate recovery support processes? Uh, uh, I, I could only comment on, on my sphere of, uh, of observation, if you like, so I couldn't talk about other areas of government, what they may have done within specific recovery needs. Uh, for example, uh, asbestos task force, that sort of, uh, that sort of recovery, recovery effort. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any, any application of, of a uh, monitoring and evaluation beyond, beyond sort of uh, informal mechanisms. Um, sh however, there, there may be op um, occasions where, where formal uh, reviews have been undertaken, uh, but certainly I, I can't, can't comment on those, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and then just, uh, just for the record, can we please bring up HAF 8001 0001 0738? I just want to confirm that this is the interjurisdictional assistance community recovery guide, that this is the document that you've been referring to in, in the answer to Commissioner McIntosh's question. Just, and just while that's That's up, correct. Sorry, I, sorry. It, no, while that's up, I didn't ask it, but that's the document that's been referred to via various titles and come up through various states in different versions over, but I think that's, from what we can understand, that's the definitive one. So it's good to put that up so everyone can see it and baseline us. Yeah. Sorry? There is a 2020 version, Chair. Uh, yeah. Sure, there is. Actually, no. Sorry, can I... It was endorsed in 2020. It was actually drafted in 2019, I think was Sorry. what it was. Perhaps, so this one is the 2019 one. You, you make a very good observation. If we could please go back to the ACT notice response at page 0145. Mr Berkovich, this is the version attached to your There we go. And That's the one the we think is a definitive right? document. That's right. There we go. Okay, so for the, for the record, that's where it is. No, I have no further questions for this witness. Um, if, if the commissioners have no further, can we just check that there's some um, parties with leave have no questions? No, they do not. Okay. Um, in that case, commissioners, could Mr. Berkovic please be released from his summons? Mr. Berkovic, thank you very much. And again, apologies for the delay today, but we do appreciate your evidence. It was uh, it was great, and uh, we uh, we appreciate also how you've talked about the sharing uh, outside the ACT. It's helped clarify a few few issues for us as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Dovey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, and you may be released from his summons. There we go. Thank you. Now, our, our next witness is scheduled for 3.15 p.m. Okay, so let's go 15.15 Canberra time, 13.15 WA time, and we'll uh, talk to Western Australia. Thank you. All rise.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms. Dovey, the run to the line. <laughs> you have the con. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Western Australia. I'd like to call Mr. Mal Cronsted, AFSM Deputy Commissioner, Strategy and Emergency Manager, Western Australia. Mr. Cronsted, hello. Yes, good. Good afternoon. <laughs> Mr. Cronsted, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate the flexibility you've given us. No trouble at all, thank you. And uh, Mr. Cronsted will take an affirmation. Mr. Cronsted, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Constead, to begin with, would you please explain your role as it relates to recovery from natural disasters for the Commissioners? Yes, certainly. Um, my position as one of two Deputy Commissioners within Western Australia covers the portfolio of recovery. Uh, the Department of Fire and Emergency Services uh, runs a recovery uh, branch and administers the disaster recovery funding arrangements for Western Australia. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd just like to quickly have a look at the, the scale of natural disasters over the last year in Western Australia. To do that, can we please bring up MAP, um, a document at PID 001001004. And this is a document that was provided by the Western Australia Department of Primary Industry and Regional Development, pursuant to a notice. And to your knowledge, does this set out, in general terms, the the kinds of natural disasters that arose over the past year in Western Australia, including in in red the fire scars for the bushfires, and then up towards near Carnarvon we can see some blue, which according to the map are Gascoigne flood warning stations. Is that right? Yes, that's correct, and it does represent it. Uh, an overview. Yeah, um, and um, you may have seen the evidence of um, Peter Fitchett from the Shire of Dundas, um, which he, the fire that he was primarily talking about was the <coughs> Norseman complex, which is the one that we can sort of see down towards the lower right-hand corner of the map. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yes, thank you very much. Now, I, I thank you for preparing the response to the notice to give information in relation to recovery. That document is at FES 007-001-0002. And Mr Cronsted, I'd ask you to just start by please giving a brief overview of recovery coordination in Western Australia, including the key recovery bodies. Um, and um, perhaps, certainly. Sorry, just, just to assist you, I'll just go ask the operator to go to um, the page at underscore triple zero three, which has the diagram that you've provided in the response. Okay, um, so recovery in Western Australia is premised on being locally led, but state supported. Uh, the diagram illustrates the full range of um, mechanisms that might be invoked across uh, a major recovery operation and the reporting relationships. Um, so there's a whole statutory policy planning framework that encompasses how that is constructed and how it works and how it's applied, uh, including guidelines, templates, and, and a whole bunch of mechanisms in support of that. So to go through the sequence, I guess, which would probably best illustrate how it fits together is, um, a local government is required to have local emergency management arrangements in place which incorporate recovery arrangements. So they've got to think about what recovery means and how to apply it. And as a state, we provide support to understand and, and build that up. They must appoint a local recovery coordinator, someone who can undertake leadership in that role. So that's the planning phase. And we'd expect that all exists throughout Western Australia at each local government. Um, and of course, at the state level, we have a, the department has a state recovery unit, a business unit that 
specialises in this and also administers the financial arrangements but provides for support statewide to local governments as and when needed. So should a fire or flood or whatever natural hazard impact the local government, the local recovery coordinator stands up. Um, it may They may invoke a local emergency coordination uh, group. And so this is assuming the incident has been dealt with, of course, and we're now into recovery phase. Um, and then as things develop, the state, we keep a very close eye on what happens at the local level and we assist and support the locals in their recovery endeavour. It's important to note that recovery, of course, starts well before sort of formal recovery coordinator might take charge. Um, and it's we really emphasise that it's got to be locally led, but also start at the response phase. So it's not an afterthought, it's not a attack on, it's and often is the case that we appoint a deputy incident controller just for recovery. So it's considered well and truly early in a um, impact phase of whatever the emergency is. So we've got a local recovery coordinator. We may have a committee set up to corral matters at that local level, supported by the state. Can I, the, can I just, um, can I, has impact? Sorry, can I just ask a question? Your, your response says that um, obviously it, it starts and it's driven from the local area up, but then at a certain point in time, if state level recovery support is necessary, and another layer will, of state support will kick in. And I, I, my question is, how is it determined when state support is necessary? Is that driven entirely by the local government or is that something that the state itself informs itself of? Um, so we work very closely with the local government and, and because of the relationships that have already been built up through our network of people in the regions and so on, we have a pretty good indication of when local governments, say remote or small local governments, are having trouble coping. So we, in the, in most cases, we'd simply be in a supportive role. You know, albeit a phone, it might be a phone call, it might be a visit, it might be building in, building an entire team behind the locals. Uh, so we we use that intelligence to build up our support as necessary to help the locals. Uh, when it becomes uh, beyond one local government, say it impacts several local governments, uh, the state would take a greater interest, and it may uh, the, the incident may be such a scale that the um, state the emergency coordinator or the the agency in control of the fire has, on an operational side, a greater system and greater. A mechanism in support of the actual response. That gives us clues about what we need to put in place for the recovery as well. So uh, ultimately the state would, would um, decide at the state level whether it's beyond a particular local government or local governments to cope with and it may invoke a state emergency, uh, rather state um, recovery coordination group, which is simply the state mechanisms getting together um, to support the local effort. And a state, uh, we have a state recovery coordinator whose day-to-day -day job it is is to keep on track of these things. And um, ultimately, as is the case now with COVID-19 and the case with a handful of bushfires in the past uh, history, that we appoint a state recovery controller who would then uh, predominantly act in a facilitatory and a sort of supportive role to, role to local governments. Um, but at the end of the day, the state May, may invoke a mechanism where the state recovery controller has a greater say and uh, collaborates across local governments and their locals. But even in the worst of circumstances, it's true to say that locals are very much in charge of their own destiny. But of course, if it covers more than one local government or it's in a remote area and local governments are really having trouble coping, uh, the state will build its support accordingly. Yep. It's a process that puts significant responsibility on local councils, which, which is consistent with the desire to have locally led recovery. What sort of processes are in place to ensure that the local councils have sufficient training management resources to deal with that level of responsibility? So we, uh, the department has a network of what we call district emergency management advisors who are specialists in emergency management generally. Uh, and are in touch with their respective local governments and their appointed recovery controllers. And uh, it is their job to build capability among local governments. 
But it'd be fair to say that um, some local governments, a, a fire of the magnitude of the ones that you illustrated, uh, are a once in a lifetime event. So it's, it, it's really hard to prepare for those sorts of things. So we, we rely on the locals to provide the local context, the local input, the local networks and so forth. But the specialists can be wheeled in behind them and our people centrally who can then travel to the field whose day-to-day -day job it is to understand this intimately have greater technical wherewithal and greater, greater expertise to support the locals. So it's an ongoing journey uh, from our day-to-day -day liaison with the individuals to build their ability and their knowledge and their exposure. But at the end of the day, um, with some of the events, it is a once-in-a-lifetime event, and we, we have specialists centrally located that assist, support, and provide that technical backup. In the map we saw earlier, there was flooding up in up towards the north. Um, it, do you know if that flooding is the result of cyclones? Is that something that happens on a regular basis? Yeah, Western Australia, as you as you as the map illustrated, is a vast state yeah. um, and covers every kind of um, sort of climate that you can imagine, and the distances are are absolutely enormous. And uh, the north of the state tends to have uh, regular flooding events uh, via cyclones or lows. Um, some, some lows turn into cyclones and others don't. But in any event, there's widespread flooding and uh, it's a regular event for Western Australia to have flooding events that damage critical essential public infrastructure such as, you know, the really long and elongated remote roads and, uh, and so on. So it's not an unusual event. Yeah, and so would it be fair to say that the councils up there have more consistent experience in dealing with recovery from natural disaster type events than perhaps some of the other ones that might get affected by a bushfire only occasionally? It, it would be true to say that, of course. Um, and going back to my earlier point about the recovery starts at response. So many of the local governments in the north of our state, the Kimberley and the Pilbara, are very accustomed to cyclones and flooding events and have finely tuned systems, processes and supporting mechanisms and we're there with them um, to deal with those matters from a response perspective. But there is no artificial line between response and recovery. It starts at the beginning. So whatever you do in response um, slowly morphs into standing communities back on their feet and getting things back to as normal as possible. So. It, it, it is quite an integrated mechanism and then our recovery team comes in up at the same time and supports that. So very accustomed and it's probably the most frequent impact that we have in Western Australia, certainly on uh, the central public infrastructure in the form of roads and the like. Yeah, certainly. Um, I note at page underscore triple zero two of the response at reference three, it stated, sets out that Western Australia does not have its own funded recovery program. Um, I assume you're referring um, to, would, would you speak to that and, and how disaster recovery funding operates within Western Australia, um, both in accordance with the DRFA and then if the DRFA is not activated, what might be available? Well, certainly. Um, by saying we don't have a, fund, a recovery program, there's not one invoked as a result of the disasters we're experiencing. We have a business unit, we have a, an agency, agency resources, and we have a team, we have, um, we have a, um, a strategy, and we have uh, strategies in place and so forth uh, to deliver recovery services. So um, when it says that we don't have a, its own funded recovery program, that's in the sense of one uh, designed to meet a particular need, such as that being experienced in the East now. Um, so we have a central unit which not only provides services through our network of district emergency management advisors to local governments and others, but we also provide similar services and a network to our peer agencies, such as Main Roads, partner communities and others, so we have a more integrated approach to delivery of recovery and building capacity among, among local governments. We also, as a department, administer the disaster recovery funding arrangements, which is one element of this whole uh, strategy of delivering on better recovery for local communities. 
pages um, underscore double zero one two to double zero one three at reference twenty five. Um, you've noticed noted that the the fires in the most recent season did not meet the perhaps we could um, pull we could we could uh, expand reference twenty five and then overleaf as well. The, the, the fires did not meet the threshold for activation of the DRFA. They nonetheless had a significant impact on local community and industries. Um, now, in that in that circumstance, there's been no federal funding that's come towards as, to assist those communities. Can you describe to what extent the Western Australian government has been able to provide support and what kinds of support might have been provided? So using that um, Norseman complex example, um, the department and our partner agencies from land management and communities and so forth have been uh, with that local government from the outset. So we've been on the journey through prevention, preparedness, response and recovery with that, with that local government and its communities. So um, the support, and as I mentioned earlier, recovery doesn't start as a discrete endeavour necessarily. It starts at the beginning of the journey. And uh, so regardless of any Commonwealth support or meeting any thresholds for Commonwealth assistance, the department was intimately involved in managing the fire, dealing with the consequences of the fire and working in partnership to develop ultimately an impact statement when the fire was controlled that described the impacts and what needs to happen from that point on. So that's the continuum, I guess, from beginning to end and the support we do regardless. Um, in that particular instance, and of course we, we recognise the impacts to that local government and, you know, the disruption to continuity of business and the main road and, and the stress and anxiety that it causes to locals in those uh, during that fire. So we're there to support them all along through that journey. Um, and as you point out, it didn't meet the threshold, which currently is $240,000 for tangible impacts to, say, essential public infrastructure. So it had impacts in other ways. And uh, I guess later on we could discuss, um, you know, some of the thresholds and some of the criteria that might apply and some of our thoughts concerning improvements in that area. I'm, I'm, happy, but I, I, I'm happy for you to go to that yep. now if you'd like to discuss those matters that you've raised. Um, so the, the threshold is $240,000 um, for Cornwall support. And as I mentioned, we're there anyway for the journey in recovery and helping and ultimately uh, the beginning of the journey after recovery is that impact statement, which I understand it's been tendered in evidence and you have. Um, so that impact statement describes what's been impacted across the various domains, you know, environmental uh, infrastructure and so on, and uh, what and some next steps, describes some next steps. Our expectation is that that, that would then be uh, incorporated into business as usual of uh, DFES, and uh, land management agencies and others to then take that up and, and pursue whatever needs to be done to affect a proper recovery. Um, in terms of improvement uh, for access to DRFA, I think it's not so much the threshold itself, it's how we come to the threshold. So how we actually assess what's damaged and what impacts have, there have been that then contribute to triggering uh, support mechanisms and the support measures. So many of them, or all of them currently rely on quantifiable and tangible impacts such as damage to main roads or damage to you know, something that you can count. Um, we feel that then it would be useful to examine the less tangible things that have impact. For instance, in the Norseman complex, the road was disrupted for 12 days. The, you know, one of our lifelines to the east, the roadway at least, and there still remains the railway, of course, but the roadway for 12 days was impacted. Um, so it would be, it would be good to be able to 
to get a handle, a better handle and have some criteria that could contribute to um, building a case for eligibility for supports um, that, aren't, that are less tangible. So, you know, business disruption, for instance, or uh, uh, perhaps criteria related to the size and extent of the natural hazard impact or some other criteria. So we, we're party to a review of the DRFA at the moment, as I know others have spoken to, and we're exploring what we could do to better quantify some of those criteria, but then would trigger the supports necessary to um, help those remote communities, such as the Shire of Dundas and Norseman, more effectively next time round. To that end, do you see that there would be benefit in a protocol at a national level for the collection of impact data? I think um, it would be useful, and I know it would be useful to have criteria or, or standardisation of some sort, or at least principle-based policy at the national level, which then could be supported by standards concerning, you know, the sharing of data and information and some the metrics that we could all agree would be reasonable ones that might contribute to criteria and thresholds. I guess that would be a sensible thing. Uh, I know the current, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, DRFA is under review, so we're hoping to input some of that, uh, some of those thoughts. So yes, it, uh, it, if we could agree on a, a nationally on a, you know, some principle-based policy, some standards that might accompany that, and then as a collaborative effort and a federation, of course, uh, we could then use that to benefit us all and trigger some of those things more. Uh, earlier and more effectively. Yeah. Miss Dovey, can I just jump in? I just want to take yeah. that a little bit further while we're on the on the this this, this discussion. We're currently looking at DRFA and uh, and discussing down that and I just need to try and clarify for the commissioners how Western Australia works. And so if I understand it from your submission and the public submissions we got from a number of people in Western Australia who were affected by bushfire uh, during the 2019-2020 season and were disappointed would probably be a multi-syllable word that they didn't qualify for any funding. Your answer goes down, well, because you didn't qualify for DFRA, there's nothing. That's not quite the approach that some other states took. Other states also provided state funding for individuals and the, and the like that uh, had been affected by fire, but I understand WA does not do that. Is that right? You've talked about we're with you all the way and all that, but you're talking about working with the, the local government. I haven't heard you mention members of the community yet and individuals. You're only working across the, the government lines. And so a simple question, does, the, does WA ever provide direct funding to individuals affected by bushfires or not? Or actually other natural hazard, natural disasters? Um, I, I can't speak, speak for the Department of Communities, but I know as a sort of human services agency, they provide supports to people who find themselves uh, impacted by whatever it is, that, including natural disasters. So there's a, a range of sort of charities and direct, direct Department of Community assistance available to individuals who fall on hard times by whatever means, including being affected by a bushfire. Um, so floods and bushfires are a common feature of Western Australia. So I guess it's a fine line between, you know, what, to what extent do we support, you know, where, where do we draw the line between eligibility and what we give, you know, what we contribute to people. Um, so uh, you're correct in saying that um, there's the normal, the normal business as usual of the agencies, the human service agencies and others and charities and, and our, our support to local governments and their communities that carry on regardless of any eligibility for Commonwealth supports. And if the trigger is then met for a particular uh, bushfire impact, um, then a, a range of additional measures are, are provided. Okay, so that's, I, I just, that's I just what see that. Want. You're sort of talking around the issue where I'm coming from. The reason I ask, I'm asking is if I go to the title of your response, it says the following response to, refer 
to references reflects the West Australian Government's perspective on recovery engagement uh, arrangements. And in your answer just then, you said, I don't know what this lot do and I don't know what that lot do in the West Australian Government. <coughs> so are you only looking at the recovery through a certain lens and you're not talking from a whole of West Australian Government point of view or you are talking from a whole of West Australian Government point of view? Um, well, I guess um, you know, I'm, I'm talking from the agency's view and its current place in recovery. Um, we've got... You know, we, we work with the Department of Communities. I, I, I guess there are areas where we could perhaps improve how we do things and how we, you know, get in earlier or provide individual supports. Um, but we administer what we administer, which is the DRFA, and we provide, you know, links to charities and other things. Um, and local governments are responsible for their particular patch and we support them. So I guess um, that's what we provide at the moment. And um, we don't uh, we don't necessarily have. Uh, though I've got to say that um, one of the things that we're working to do is, I guess, and Yalu fire in 2016 really taught us a few lessons. Is that um, having a, a one-stop shop or, or, or something equivalent, so people could just have one exposure to one person to seek, you know, the whole range of supports for them. But the focus at the moment, I think, um, is that we, we we provide recovery on a normal day-to-day -day business yeah. basis, and then when something bad happens, it meets a threshold or is larger. We then provide increasing supports to scale to the to the you know the policy that we currently have. No, where I'm coming from is what we're trying to do is get an understanding nationally what support is available to communities and individuals, businesses, local governments and the like. What, what I'm trying to get an understanding of in West Australia, are we missing a piece in the response that we need to, to seek or, and, and in this case, it's how the state responds to members of the state, so communities in the state, not just local governments, in response to natural disasters. Because as I said, we've had a number of public submissions that have um, voiced a frustration that because the DF, DRFA, and they don't even know what DRFA, they just heard a Commonwealth announcement of which they weren't qualified to, uh, to, to get. Because that didn't kick in, there was no money, no funding to them. What I'm asking is, is there a state mechanism to provide funding within the, the framework of, of recovery and it's a yes or no. And I think for what I'm hearing is the answer is no. It's either Commonwealth or nothing or a charity kick, kicks in. Is that the correct understanding? Same goes for businesses, by the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. The, um, there, either we have it or we don't. I, I, I guess the Department of Communities has its own mechanisms to support people in need, which we don't, as a matter of course, incorporate or think of as recovery. Uh, okay. All right. Thank, thank you for that. Ms. Dovey, please. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps just to round that out, um, I might go yeah, to page, page 0013 of the response um, in respect of small businesses specifically at references 26 and 27. We've been discussing mostly individuals, also small businesses. Um, just the responses on small businesses in respect of this bushfire season is that there isn't a specific estimate of how many small businesses have been affected. Um, and, and essentially what I understand from the answer to reference 27 is that specific disaster recovery support would be potentially provided to small businesses if it met the current criteria for DRFA activation, but in the absence of that, there's no specific disaster recovery support for small businesses. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, now, you've helpfully attached to the response um, a document at FES 007 001-0003, which is your recovery key areas of focus for 2019 to 2021. If we could please bring that up. Um, um, my question in relation to this document is whether there's a structure for accountability against these goals. Is there a review process? If so, is it done internally or externally? How is 
the uh, how is the tracking against these key areas, key areas of focus measured? Um, the State Emergency Management Committee uh, is, you know, we, we report or they receive reports on, you know, how things are tracking on a regular basis. So they meet five times a year to hear about progress against the plan and any subsidiary plans. There's a committee structure beneath that, and one of which is specifically addresses community engagement and recovery. Uh, so they have a works program, they report against the works program, and we track against that. Um, and of course, then there's the usual governance around annual reporting and uh, and the like. Uh, so that's that's essentially how we do it. Okay. So there's the, the performance measures and the performance governance around running an agency and running programs. So that's essentially an internal self-reporting set of measurements against this. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Though um, the, the State Emergency Management Committee also has a um, has a um, capability framework and a, um, does a, does a regular provides regular advice to the minister and others about how the committee and how the how those things are tracking in particular. So uh, there is a reporting mechanism and uh, advice to the minister concerning how things are going. And of course, publicly, you'd have to look at the annual report or. Um, you know, the, the stuff on the State Emergency Management Committee website, which would illustrate how things are going. Thank you. Just, just one moment. Um, are you aware of the Victorian Inspector General of Emergency Management assisting to build a small internal assurance group within Western Australia? Um, no, I'm not. Um, no. So I understand we heard evidence on that the other day, but I won't take it any further with you. That's fine. Um, can we move on to um, the, the state in a recovery space, the coordination between Western Australia and the Commonwealth? We've talked about the DRFA. Um, otherwise, can you describe any interaction that you've had with EMA or NBRA and how you feel that level of interaction, that, that coordination works in the recovery support space? Um, we've had a long relationship with EMA and of course now the, um, the objectives of the new agency um, and involvement all through that journey with their various governance structures and, and committees. So we're, we're um, very aware and very involved in the developments in that area. So it's fair to say that given the impacts in the eastern states, we've, we've had um, not not the depth of involvement of other jurisdictions, of course, but nevertheless, we're keen to, you know, to learn from their experience, but also contribute to the, contribute to moving forward and building a better recovery framework. So uh, the DRFA review is one, one of those interactions which we're really keen to have input into and um, and make sure we get into a better place down the track. So, in addition, we've got liaison officer, you know, great liaison officer interaction between the agencies, and uh, we have uh, someone in place there. Support. We've offered support, and we've got someone in place at the moment supporting them. So, really close relationship, and really understand what's going on and the mutual benefits that might arise from uh, their work. Can I? Ask the operator to go to page um, 000, oh sorry, we're a different document. Um, back to the response, which is FES 007001002 to page triples, uh, underscore 0004. At reference five, the first dot point under that, that question, you've said that there's currently no formalised resource sharing arrangements between Western Australia and other state and territories and all the Commonwealths which solely focus on recovery. We had heard some evidence earlier about the guidelines for inter-jurisdictional assistance community recovery prepared by the Social Recovery Reference Group. We've seen a number of iterations of that. We've seen a version dated 2019 and 2020. Um, Perhaps we can bring up the, um, I have the reference to the 2019 version here, which is HAF 8001 0001 0738. 
Um, and my question is whether you're aware of this document um, and, and whether Western Australia has had any involvement in the pre preparation of it or the use of it? Um, I've only got peripheral awareness of it, though um, in my, this, I know that our human services agency, the Department of Communities, has had long held arrangements, uh, large, both in, largely informal as I understand it, where given they're in the same industry, they sh sh um, share resources and um, provide support to each other. So I know that's been a long-term arrangement that they've had with their equivalents in other jurisdictions. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, that, that, that's, that's my understanding. Okay. Is, is this a document you've seen before? I don't recognise the cover, but I have heard of it and I have heard discussions around it. Okay. Um, so go ahead. No, I was just going to say there are, I mean, there are other mechanisms here. And perhaps what's missing is a is an integrated approach. Um, our agency is as part of an you know, in a response phase. We have some really good and uh, maturing arrangements over many years for sharing response arrangements. Um, perhaps what's missing is the link between that and an integrated approach to uh, sharing resources for recovery. Also, um, because you know though, though the health. Uh, the uh, human services areas have got some arrangements, bringing them in an integrated fashion so that we can all contribute more usefully across jurisdictional boundaries for recovery would be uh, a useful endeavour. Certainly. Uh, perhaps you don't know in which case it's fine, but I, I'll just check. Do you know if Western Australia has representatives on the social recovery reference group? Um, I'm not aware, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised that our Department of Communities would be represented. Okay, thank you. Um, now, at uh, page 0005, the third dot point under reference 7, you've noted that Western Australia is working with the ANZ EMC um, CAUSE, I'll, I'll use the acronym, on the national framework. Um, can I ask you? whether you think there's value in having a national framework and what that would add to the coordination of recovery support? I think a, um, a principle-based national framework would be uh, of great value. Um, there's been quite a bit of work in the response area and, of course, the risk reduction area, the framework. So extending that and having an integrated approach to emergency management and having a principle-based uh, framework that that encompasses things such as standardised information sharing, um, capability building, sharing skills or um, building card raise at a national level that can bring into action across any jurisdiction, those sorts of things. But starting with a framework and a principle-based policy that then sets out what, you know, what the boundaries are and um, provides the guidance across that, that would be very useful. Given that you've mentioned it, um, I actually had meant to take you to this, the notion of the state recovery cadres. Um, would you mind talking to how that program works and how it came about? Certainly. Um, after the Yaloot fire in 2016, um, we, uh, we felt that one of the le lessons learned from that um, and a report was done of, uh, after the fire and one of the lessons was that we needed a pool of individuals that could be skilled in various disciplines and, and technical abilities that could then uh, focus their attention on building those skills, specialising in their particular endeavour, and then be available as a cadre or a pool of individuals who swung into action in any area of the state or, or even in, in interstate. So the, the concept was building a, a, a cadre of individuals who would have an ongoing program of development and then be, um, you know, come together on from time to time, used in exercises and then swing into action when required and uh, build that support that's necessary for local government and local communities. So the state can then stand behind the locals who have the intimate knowledge of the local circumstance, but we can swing the specialists who are far more familiar far more practised and really understand their business in behind them. Um, and as I said, local governments 
uh, many times these things are a once in a lifetime event, um, it seems sensible to build a card rate to support wherever it's required. And is that a program that's in action at the moment, that's operational? It is. So we've spent a couple of years developing that and it's maturing and getting better and better over time. So we've got people who are available now and have different specialisations and then we can call on them as required to um, assist local governments and others. There haven't been too many opportunities um, in Western Australia, fortunately, um, to, to you know, evoke them, them um, in any great extent, but um, uh, no doubt our time will come where we need to draw on those people and then support local governments, particularly those of the smaller ones and the regional ones. And I guess, um, you know, they don't experience that stuff. That's not their day, daily business. We can then uh, support them. So we're, we're um, really happy with the progress of the program and how it's building up capability across the state. And we have confidence that we have people available on, on call who we can draw on for particular specialisations in recovery. You mentioned earlier that there was a possibility it could be, those people could be used to provide support interstate. Is that something that you've offered up or you've communicated to other states might be available? We have, um, in, uh, through the NBRA and others, we've, um, we've done so. Um, I know we've got one person uh, that's currently with the NBRA. So I guess that's in part the reflection of some of our expertise and uh, our contribution to the national effort. But um, we stand ready to support at any occasion and I know our colleagues in other states would do similarly. On that page that is currently up, if we can just go down to the following dot point under reference seven, that fourth one down, if we can just bring up, um, you've referred to research showing a lack of risk ownership in the community. Um, and the, the response states that this results in underinsurance and poor community preparation. It further states that education and community engagement will, will assist the community and businesses to understand the risk of natural disasters. Um, and I'm just wondering if you are able to elaborate on any suggestions as to the kinds of education and community engagement that you think would be required to make change in this space. Um, as I mentioned earlier, recovery is only one part of a bigger picture, which is that um, good recovery starts with the, the very front end, uh, understanding the risk at the, at the individual level and the, and the community level, and then um, building that capability such that so during response and recovery, people can stand back up on their feet so much more readily, they're far more resilient and capable of meeting the hazard and uh, dealing with it. Um, we've got, um, we're really of the view that well, we've got a community engagement program. We're trying to take an integrated approach in this department where both community engagement and recovery are in the one branch so that um, community engagement goes hand in hand. So what we, what we do with communities and what we help local governments and their communities and individuals build in terms of resilience and understanding the hazards and what they can do about it, then holds them in great stead down the track. But when recovery comes along, it's so much easier, it's less stressful and so on. That's not a perfect, uh, it's, not a, it's not perfect. And we, you know, it'd be fair to say that we're not, we haven't got it absolutely right, but we're committed to the journey of making sure that people understand their risk, take out appropriate insurance coverage, they deal with the treatments that they're able to locally, you know, the usual things that they need to do to prepare for bushfires, and cyclones and floods, and um, then engage with their local communities uh, so that recovery it is lessened. I mean, recovery is the back, it, it is the bit we want to avoid. We want to avoid having um, people dependent and um, agonise and prolonged recovery. We want communities, and it's a long-term goal to build resilience among individuals and communities. And of course, our work with local governments is so critical there because they really understand the people at that level, they understand their needs. And uh, it goes back to our point about local government, local communities and the individuals that make them 
thing so so critical to this old endeavour. So we we I retain we I reiterate that model. State stands behind the locals, and and that's how we operate. Are you able to point to? Do you think there's any? specific actions, specific forms of community engagement that seem to be actually making progress in this area that are resulting in higher levels of insurance or people taking higher levels of responsibility for managing their own risk? Um, well, Western Australia, we've got, uh, I mean, there's great collaboration across jurisdictions in Australia in terms of adapting programs that address particular risks. Um, and bushfire is one of those. Um, we have a program called Fire Chat here, which um, facilitates local conversations about their local circumstances and going through, guiding people through. So, what? Where do I live? What do I? You know, what circumstances am I in? What are the hazards? And what can I do to, you know, prepare? You know, is have I? Do I have a plan? You know, what about my insurance? Is it adequate? So on. So steps people through that. Insurance being one element, but there are many, many other elements that have got to come together to uh, make for resilient communities. Thank you. Commissioners, I, I note the time. I want to give you a chance to ask questions, so I'll, I'll hand over to you. Just, uh, I've got one question. Can we put that original map back up at the start, please? I'm just interested in... You know, understanding what that map oh, sorry. showed. Oh, One moment. Yeah, what was the... That record? was um, PID 001 001 There we are. So that, that's a West Australian provided map. Is that right? That's right. Okay. This was provided by the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. So just, just a question. Are they... What you have here, are they bushfires that have we have enacted a recovery response. They're obviously not all the, the bushfires that you had during the season. Yes, that's that's right. They're, they're not all the bushfires. There's many, many uh, the smaller bushfires that would be scattered predominantly around the southwest corner of the state. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I, I need to make a point that the um, so as the response is scaled up, recovery, we often appoint a deputy incident controller. So in the larger level two, what we call level two or three fires, the bigger ones, mm -hmm. uh, we, we focus, and obviously scale it up and focus attention on having someone dedicated to thinking about recovery and what it means, and in particular, drawing up the impact statement, which then codifies uh, the, you know, what's affected and what we need to do about it. So that's, that's kind of the aim of that, that position and where we want to end up with, but also making sure that whatever you do in response helps you with recovery. So the map uh, as, as, um, okay. doesn't illustrate all those other little fires where there'd be various scales of recovery, whether it's called recovery or not. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Thanks. Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify one thing with you. Um, you know, we've had a discussion about, I think at the beginning you explained that um, recovery, you know, you've said a number of times recovery is part of the um, whole of, it starts with the response and it moves through to recovery and that, you know, that you then uh, utilise that part of what you utilise as impact statements. And we've, we've also discussed um, some of the funding issues in terms of um, when uh, funding for individuals is available and you were also talking about the fact that um, Western Australia has been involved with the NBRA and I think you've got somebody seconded to the NBRA. So I want to clarify if I might just one part of the answer you gave if, if um, underscore triple zero six could be brought up and reference nine. Right, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, you've come out there very strongly against a standalone Commonwealth agency, and you've got there responsible for response and recovery in relation to all national natural disasters. Now, from what you've said, I understand that because of the emphasis on, on local, local government res, uh, input and dealing with things at the local level, um, in the response phase, um, strictly the response phase, if I can isolate it, you would say that, you know, that, that is a matter for you within the state. But I'm, I'm curious as to why you um, 
say that there should not be a standalone Commonwealth agency responsible for recovery, if I can put recovery into that um, different part of the equation. Because the NBRA, for example, I mean, are you against the NBRA? Um, well, the states d doesn't want to see, I guess, a bureaucracy established at the Commonwealth level that would then um, divert resources away from where it matters in terms of local and uh, the state standing behind the locals and the Commonwealth stand, standing behind the Commonwealth, uh, the state rather. So I guess our emphasis is that rather, rather focus on uh, a policy framework, uh, some collaboration that would, and standards that might uh, fall out of that and uh, bring that all together, but not don't necessarily create an agency at the Commonwealth level, which is not only not proximate to the, to the impacts, but may, may divert resources away from where it really matters. Well, I'm just looking at the different attitudes about what happens at the recovery phase and the fact, for example, that you said that with business loss and matters such as that, that the state doesn't provide funding and there could be a situation where, as has happened, where you don't um, get to the stage of being able to activate um, Commonwealth, the existing forms of Commonwealth funding. But the NBR, I mean, would you disband the NBRA or would you never have set it up? If it be, was your decision, would you never have set up the NBRA, as far as Western Australia is concerned? Well, I guess what the Commonwealth sets up is... is no, 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 I'm asking, no, no, not what the Commonwealth sets up. You, you've said you're, that Western Australia does not, su does not support um, a standalone Commonwealth agency. Now, I understand what you say res with responsibility for response. I understand your position on that. What I don't comprehend is why you say that there should not be a standalone agency at all at the Commonwealth level for dealing strictly with recovery, and we're talking about the sorts of recovery, um, not so much, you know, only the, build you're about the building of roads, but provision of support to individuals affected by it. Now, I don't comprehend why um, you say there's no role for such an agency. Let's say that such an agency brought in principles of jurisdiction neutral provision of, of funding for affected Australians and some of those Australians are Western Australians. Would you say that there was no role for um, standards to be brought in or criteria to be brought in that should be applicable to Western Australians? Well, I think, uh, I think standards and, and, and uh, principle-based policy and, and all the you know, resources behind that I guess what we what we're fearful of is is a large standalone agency that might divert resources. It's as simple as that. I think it's it's just that you know the Commonwealth can establish a structure and a mechanism to do all the things necessary for establishing a policy, establishing standards, providing supporting mechanisms to the states, and so on. But I guess we're just fearful that the establishment of a Commonwealth agency might divert unnecessarily create another, yet another agency. Um, we've, got the, we've got EMA and we've got, you know, those mechanisms. Um, uh, we, we prefer simply to build on the good we've got. Well, just one more, if I can take it that, that way. You said you're happy to have some, a Commonwealth agency, whether it uh, deal with the provision of principles and standards and matters such as that. What about eligibility criteria for Commonwealth funded recovery programs? Well, indeed, that, that could be one of the things that's, um, that's invoked. Um, I guess there's two, two, two issues here. One is the, um, what, you, what, you, what is produced in terms of policy and standards and provisions and supports and measures and so on, and how it's done. So I guess uh, what we're railing against is the, is the how and the resources that might accompany the how. I see. I th well, I think I understand the position. Thank you for clarifying that. That's very helpful. Commissioner McIntosh. Yeah, just quickly. Thanks for your time. Um, in the document, I'll pull up to star 08 if I could. You, you've made reference to the National Impact Assessment Model. And previously you were talking about um, how the processes for collection of data could be improved by some standardisation of what is collected and and the form in which it is collected. And, and I just wondered whether you could comment on whether there's, or well, there seems to be gaps in the National Impact Assessment Model. Um, if you could provide comment on that. Is the, is the National Impact Assessment Model, of which I have not seen, is that 
is the type of data that's collected under that too high level? You know, what are the gaps in that process at the moment? Uh, I'm not an expert in the uh, NIAM itself, um, but as I understand it, the NIAM is, you know, prescribed metadata, in other words, data about data, you know, the features of the data you're trying to collect. Yep. Um, so we're, we're supportive of that framework and we'll work to improve it over time. But as I said, I don't know the intricacies of it other than we you know, we support it. We'd like to see a, a, a more, more, more mature standard and uh, we'll contribute uh, and if we can, you know, that would be one of the things that would be quite useful. Yeah, that sounds like at the moment it's a metadata standard and what we're looking for is more of the micro and the MESO level stuff. So it gives specific directions on what you should collect on particular things so we have standardisation. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Nothing more, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I understand we have, we have nothing from parties with leave, but no one's asked to say anything, um, and I have no further questions. So, um, may the, Mr Cronstead please be released from his summons. Mr Cronstead may be released from his summons. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and once again, thank you for your flexibility and your forthright responses. We appreciate that very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I have an, a couple of housekeeping matters, if I may. Yes, you may. Before uh, Ms. Stubby introduces the final video. Yes, witness. please. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, Reintroduces, I should say. Um, just first up, uh, I want to give an update on the balance of responses by states and territories to the Commission's notices to give information. I said at transcript 1479 that I would tender during the course of this week uh, the, that m massive material. Uh, I'm advised that the deduplication and supplementation process is nearly complete, uh, but I will defer that tender till next week. Okay. Uh, uh, so we'll do that Monday before we start the session. When we have that, yes. Okay. Uh, the second matter is that transcript 1480, I also said I would tender the responses to the firefighting issues paper mm -hmm. as soon as the responses from key stakeholders have been processed. Um, I'm advised that the Royal Commission has received the submission of the State of Victoria, uh, but is still awaiting the response of the State of New South Wales, so I will also defer that tender. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third matter is that the witness list for next week, I understand, is in the process of being uploaded to the website. Uh, the, I said then that we would be calling the current emergency agency leaders from next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, now, due to... Just one moment. Uh, in light of the recent surge in COVID-19 cases in Victoria, um, the State of Victoria has advised that Commissioner Crisp, who is the head of the Emergency Management Victoria, uh, is currently experiencing significantly increased operational demands in his role coordinating Victoria's pandemic response. Um, noting the considerable diversion of resources by EMV and other agencies in responding to this crisis, uh, his ability to give evidence before the Commission is now significantly constrained. Um, we, have ex we have accepted the request that he not be required uh, next Wednesday, uh, so on the 16th of July, uh, and that Deputy Commissioner Stevenson would attend and we were proposed to make arrangements, um, if possible, for a subsequent um, date for, Mr. for Commissioner Crisp's appearance. No, I understand what's happening in Victoria at the moment, and uh, and we can be a bit flexible to uh, to cover that. Although, if there are questions that come out of it that only he can answer, then we will look to pursue that down down track. Yes. No, let's go. Uh, and that is the only other matter. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Miss Dovey, you're going to introduce the, the video. Well, I am. I, I, I did Again. introduce the video this morning. <laughs> uh, I probably won't repeat all of what I said. Um, I'll, I'll just reiterate that we're going to hear from Jenny and Arthur Robb. They're small business people from Kaya, outside of Eden, New South Wales. Large part of their business was tourism, largely from Victoria. Obviously, the current situation with COVID-19 will have affected that area even more severely than when we spoke with them. Yes. Um, the focus of this is on the impact of the fires on small businesses in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said earlier, the evidence has been edited um, and the original footage of the evidence is also available. The video runs for around 32 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we ask that we play the 
video evidence and adjourn for the day on the conclusion of the video. So we'll adjourn uh, the completion of the video and we will look to reconvene at 13.30 Canberra time on Monday. Uh, and could I just take the chance to thank you for all your efforts and hard work as well. We really do appreciate it. You put thank a lot you, of hard yards in. We couldn't get to where we are without you, so thank you. Thank you. Jenny and Arthur, could you please each give us your name and uh, tell us your occupation? Jenny Rob, our tour operator. And Arthur Donald Rob, I used to be a concrete and now I've retired. I work for the wife. He, he works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, could you please uh, tell us about your, your backgrounds, Arthur, we just had a little bit of yours, and how you came to live in Kaya and how long you've been living in the area? Uh, I moved down here <clears throat> 23 years ago. I was spent 17 <laughs> years in Brisbane and I came down here looking for a property on a river access to the ocean and this is what drove me down here and I found it in this area and it's gone on from there. And I uh, met my first husband in Sydney and he was a Davidson of the famous Davidson whaling family here. Moved to Eden. Uh, we moved to Kaya with a small baby in 1982 and I lived just over the ridge from where we are now. And um, Arthur and I got together in the early 2000s and we got married in 2001. And so I've been on this property for 20 years. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me about the businesses that you were running before the bushfires came along? What what businesses the two of you were running together? So were you talking about the caravans? Well, I... I we have a large yard and we did caravan storage. That was one way of bringing income when I first arrived here. And that's been totally burnt. The shed's gone and all the fencing and that's gone now. So, uh, and, then and then Jen started a few other businesses up. So I had kayak tours running out of the property. And we just established two campsites. We've now got three because we had to look after some people who were evacuating from fires north of Batemans Bay. So we created another one. But um, <clears throat> so we had three camp campsites, the kayak tours, and we also ran a walking tour in the National Park south of here called Light to Light Camps on the Light to Light Walk. That business can't operate now because of the fire. Um, National Parks have advised us recently that they're not starting to re-establish the track till 2021 with a view to finish in 2022. So in an email from National Parks with no actual name attached to it, we were advised that we had no business for the next two and a half years. So all four businesses were impacted. <laughs> Can you just describe the location of Kaya for those who aren't familiar with where you are in Australia? Uh, where our property is 11.67 kilometres south of Eden, New South Wales. Kaya as a locality goes for another, you know, 50 odd k's around the area. So, and there were uh, over 45 homes destroyed in Kaya. That I understand. Yep. And you're just north of the Victorian border, is that right? Yes, about... Uh, 50 kilometres? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the other kinds of businesses that are in your community? At, at Kaya itself, there are mostly small agricultural or just, um, you know, home, far, hobby farm type things. Um, in Eden, a lot of tourism businesses, hospitality businesses, there's a small fishing fleet, there's a mussel farm. Um, nearly everything has a link with tourism though. Yeah. Yeah. And before these, this most recent season, <coughs> what was your knowledge of bushfires like, your experience of bushfires? Uh, we'd been in the RFS for close on 18 years. And we haven't seen any major fires, but I've seen enough smaller fires to realise that we sh don't want to be here when this big fire came through. So we protected our house as best we could and we left. Yeah, okay. 
Um, maybe just on that, when you say you protected your house, can you talk a little bit about the preparations that were mo made both on your property and in the area in advance of what looked like a bad fire season? Well, our house is concrete all the way around the house. So all the way around the house. Fires away. We have a big tank above the house. We turn the tap on when we drove away to happily just moisten the ground a little. It seemed to work. And we were just lucky. That's all it was. Mm. It's just nothing you can do with a fire like that will save anything if it hits at the right time and the right pace. Mm. And other areas, forestry did give them a hand. They came and knocked over trees and around some of the houses. They came through, asked us if we were okay. I said, yes, we're fine. There's nothing more we can do. And, um, yeah. Having but, River Flat yeah. helped, helped sort of just slow it a bit, I think, occasionally. Um, our neighbour, he, he stayed on the flat uh, during the fire and watched the fire come up the hill, but it, none of the River Flats seemed to have burnt. So that was sort of just slowed it down in some sections, I think, yeah. But it was yeah, so um, dry, um, I'm surprised that that helped. <laughs> Yeah. It was very, very dry. Yeah. Mm. Um, talking about the process when the fires came through, if you're comfortable doing so, would you mind just briefly describing what happened in your area? Um, and if, maybe talk a little bit about the information you had as to the fire, where it was, and what you found useful in that respect? Firstly, the ABC radio probably saved a lot of lives in this area. Um, Yes, there was the Fires Near Me app, but it wasn't as updated as the Victorian app. Um, and being close to the border, it was frustrating to see on both the apps, the fire looked like it had a hard edge along the border. It was ridiculous. And, you know, when you, when you don't know where the thing is, we knew it was coming for three days. We knew it was coming and we knew it was between Malacuta and here, but we didn't really know where. And that was... That was a bit, that uncertainty was a bit scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so you you evacuated when the, you saw the fire was coming. When was that? Uh, we knew the fire was coming. We evacuated around lunchtime of the day. We On went the 4th of January. The 4th of January. We went into town, down to the wharf, because that's the safest place to be. And we just just left at that and we had no idea what, what the fire, you couldn't see anything. The smoke was at ground level, you could only see probably about five metres in front of you. And that was, and that was it, yep. Knowing that the fire was coming, I understand that you had taken some of your assets off the property, is that correct? Yes, yes. anything that we made money out of, like the caravan storage, or the camp trailers, the um, all the camping gear, all the kayaks were taken into town, put in a safe location. Yeah. Uh, we knew the fire had hit Malacuta on the 31st of December and we had a bad day here that day and we weren't sure. And then we knew that the weather was going to change again and push it our way, you know, on the 4th. We were watching that really closely, the weather. Um, so we just we just worked flat out for, the, for those two days between um, just getting everything out of here. And, and I spent a lot of time, like, cancelling bookings and because there were just we were booked out we we're booked out everywhere so i spent a lot of time on the phone um just sorting that out getting refunds back to people and so forth um yeah we just we knew it was coming <laughs> yeah 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 <clears throat> um in the period just before and after the fires did you lose infrastructure power phones road access all of those. <laughs> we lost power. We lost power, lost phone. Um, we had, well, the highway was closed from the from about 10k south of us to the south. So we had our son and daughter-in-law here uh, with our grandchildren. So we sent them home early on the 31st because we knew the weather was going to change. And uh, they took 10 hours to get to Melbourne because they had to sort of crisscross all over the place as roads were closing and opening around them, which was terrifying for all of us. Um, yeah, I can't remember what the question was now, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about uh, losing <clears throat> critical infrastructure from the area with yeah, road access, so, power, telephone, yeah. those sorts of things. So we had no power for, I think, three weeks. Um, 
in saying that, Essential Energy were excellent. Whenever we called, we could get somebody who was telling us roughly when we might get power. Um, we had no mobile service for at least a week. Um, no longer. A bit longer, actually, and we had to, and we had no internet because we had ADSL. Uh, broadband uh, that whole line got cooked so we didn't have any we didn't have any internet for a month that was really challenging when you're trying to communicate with people who've booked we had bookings for the walking tours the campsites and the kayak tours so I had a lot of phone calls and emails to make and refunds to do which was very challenging when we didn't have any of those services yeah <coughs> Yeah. Um, so how did you manage that with the business when you didn't have any phone access at your property? Oh, all sorts of ways. I went and sat in cafes in town that if they had internet, um, I'd sit in the main street because there's um, Wi-Fi in the main street of Eden. Frustrating though, because often what I needed to look for was on the computers back here or whatever. Um, yeah, it was, it, or I just drove up, if I drove up the road about three to five k's if i got on a hill i could pick up mobile service <laughs> so i sometimes hot spotted off my phone because you didn't want to get dressed you know like <laughs> when you go to town when you live out of town you have to get dressed properly to you know i <laughs> was like all sorts of stuff going on in my head i just wanted to get the work done but yeah it was challenging <laughs> What was the state of your property like? It looks very green behind you at the moment, but I mean, the fire came through, so it didn't look like that at the time. No, absolutely no. not. It was black everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. The house itself. The house it itself out. survived. Um, it burnt all the way around the house to within a meter and cracked a window. Um, but yeah, the house is made well. It's corrugated iron for a reason. Mm -hmm. So, so was that house specifically built for the environment? No. It, it, no. Initially it was a shed and they had it lined inside and they had fibro on the outside but the fibro started to fall off so I got colour bond, put, I put it on the walls just to a cheap easy way of... But we also it knew it was a good fire protection. We, Arthur was a concreter so we had a lovely concrete veranda all the way around the house and that also I'm sure helped. We moved all of the furniture off the off the veranda. Everything was off the veranda. So there wasn't any we knew we knew having been in the fire brigade, we knew about Ember Attack, we knew how easy it could be to start a fire. So everything was off the veranda. So there was nothing that was likely to be able to catch and ignite the house. So our preparation combined with good luck saved the house. Yeah. Um other than that, the house was saved. Yep. Did you lose other structures on the property? Everything else. All of our sheds, the bridge to one of our campsites, um, and the whole garden. Yeah. And the garage. To, to, to those of us who live in cities, a shed might sound like it is, is not necessarily of significant value, but I understand that if you're living in the country and if you're running business off a country property, um, tell, us, tell us about the value of the sheds. Well, the shed is seven metres deep and 100 metres long. Was. So it was a very large shed, <laughs> and we used to store the caravans in it for undercover storage. That's what it was built for. That was one part mm. of the shed. The other part, we concreted the floor and put roller doors in, and that was where we stored our kayaks and all the gear for the kayak tours and the trailer for the walking tours. So, yeah, losing the sheds was probably pretty major for us. And were you insured? Yeah, but the when we had we had seventy thousand dollars insurance on the big shed, and when they assessed it, they said it was probably two hundred and seventy thousand dollars to replace it. So we Does haven't re a, <laughs> we haven't replaced a hundred meter right? shed. Was that a surprise as to the the actual oh. cost of replacement? Oh, I thought it was a little bit high, but yeah, I expected that we were definitely under. Yeah, it's well, we hard to assess, you know, you, and you sort of don't, when you're getting house insurance and you sort of don't even think about the fact that the whole lot could go. You think maybe 
you know, something ignites in the shed and it burns down and it's just one shed, but it was all the sheds and that, yeah. So we were underinsured. We were lucky that we had the insurance that we did have um, because that's enabled us to rebuild a smaller shed. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, we, we've still got a bit to go. So, so where are you currently keeping the things that were previously in the shed? In a container. So all the kayaks are shoved like Tetris into a container at the moment um, that we bought. Beg your pardon? Like a shipping container? Yeah, yeah shipping container. We had, uh, so we applied mm. for a grant straight away because we had, we had to get the kayaks out of the shed we had in town because it was being demolished. So we had to get them home, but we had no security. So we, our son in Melbourne organised for a container to be brought up, yep. I can't even remember when that arrived. Halfway through January, maybe. <clears throat> okay, so we've touched on this a bit already, but could you describe, maybe just take us through the whole of how the fires have affected the businesses that you were running before they came through? Well, we can't have the caravan storage anymore because we lost the big shed and all the fences. We... We've re-established a campsite, but it, not where we want it to be because the bridge to the campsite burnt. Um, we, we probably had maybe two tours between the fires and COVID, and then COVID hit, so... Um, but we would have been getting some bookings by now, I think. Um, and we can't run the light to light tour at all. Um, our, where we run it which was on a specific walking track that has been completely obliterated. And the, the time of year that you've missed from summer through to now it's June, basically in winter, um, is that a busy time for your businesses? Yeah. Our walking tours would have been ramping up now. Um, we had bookings right through till October for those. Um, we sometimes have kayak tours in June, but it's mostly for internationals. June, July, August tends to be internationals. So uh, we had a busy long weekend because the three campsites were booked out. So yes, um, yeah. we've missed we've missed pretty much the main part of the year with the kayak tours. We're normally busy up until now, and then it slows down until about September. Yeah. Yes. So that's why we do the walking tours then. <laughs> and what was the effect of the fires on the rest of the community, the businesses that you said largely are connected with tourism? Uh, I can't even begin to think that it, it's just huge, absolutely huge. Um, not only the personal impact and the mental impact on everybody, because everybody knew someone who lost homes um but we lost we lost all of our tourism trade um so on the first of january ironically arthur's birthday there was a community meeting in town and basically that was where they said you all the tourists have to go home we had family in bermagui and they described the panic and the chaos that went on there um, but once they'd all gone the with the roads closed they couldn't come back. Even if we had the empty ski stay with us, all that stuff going on, they couldn't get here. Mm. So that was a massive impact. And it's, it's, people are still reeling and I think a lot of business will close. How long were the roads closed for again? Oh, I think four to six weeks, depending on which road. They were, they were all over the place. Yeah, yeah. it was a long yeah. time. And that's the school holiday period, isn't it? Yeah, and our major, our, we get 75% of our domestic tourism from Melbourne. So that was the road that was closed. So um, from Bansdale pretty much north to the Victorian border or further, that, that road was closed for weeks and weeks, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then school went back. So, well, it didn't, or it did. <laughs> but, yeah, all of our holiday makers couldn't get back. Yeah. Yeah. Massive impact. Okay, so, in that context, can you talk for a bit about the kinds of support 
that have been offered and made available, um, what the process has been for seeking and obtaining that support, um, and what about that has worked and what hasn't worked. I think we're lucky that the Bega Valley Shire had some experience with massive fires from the Tathra fires a couple of years ago because they were very quick to establish a bushfire recovery centre in, in Bega. It was, it was awkward that it was in Bega to start with. They set out some satellite ones later. Um, it was pretty overwhelming, but I, I, I don't blame anyone for that. It was just such an overwhelming event and so many people impacted that it was confronting. The first time I went there, there were people still bandaged, you know, so... Um, and it was just traumatic repeating it over and over again to different agencies. I think it would have been, you know, in hindsight, obviously. It'd be great to have just one person hear your story in, instead of having to say it over and over again because it gets overwhelming. Um, we were able, I mean, I'm pretty switched on with grants because I've done that in the past with my work. So the grant process wasn't that onerous um, if you were burnt. So we were, we had plenty of evidence. Everything was burnt down. So we had plenty of photos to show that that happened to us. Um, I know of lots and lots of small businesses that were really traumatised by the whole process and not able to get a cent until well into January and then it was like $10,000 which really didn't have any impact on them. They were flawed. Were those businesses directly or indirectly? Indirectly. Um, you know, an example, a little brewery up the road. I mean, we collaborate in tourism all the time. We work together all the time and I talk to the friends of ours that run this business up the road and their first two weeks of January trade is normally sixty to $70,000 and they had $6,000. It's, it was just, and then it was like, oh, well, you know, you weren't impacted because you weren't burnt. But people couldn't get here, and that was why they were impacted as much, you know. Obviously, the first week after the fires, everyone was just reeling and no one wanted to work anyway. But once that was over, the initial... But mind you, we had smoke for a month, so that didn't help. <laughs> that didn't make it feel very comfortable here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what financial assistance you've been able to, to get for your businesses? We were lucky. We were able to, because we had a number of businesses running out of here and two ABNs, we were able, both able to get the $50,000 from um, the New South Wales government. That was a huge, huge injection and helped us get our shed back up well, we've got one garage built now. We've got the shed slab down for the new for the new shed, and the shed kit arrived yesterday. Um, so we're doling it out. Um, but and although we were insured, we weren't insured to the extent that we probably should have been. Um, so that's enabled us to rebuild a shed that's purpose built and going to help us, you know, get back into business. Yeah. 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 Um, in terms of money from charities, have you had have you personally had any interactions with charities? Yes, we in the first week when I first went up, um, yeah, everyone was look. You spent virtually the first two weeks in tears. Um, we got twenty thousand dollars from um, Red Cross, but that was I had to really like almost beg for that. Um, mainly because our house didn't get burnt down, but we had no income at all, and we were pretty worried about that. Um, we, I mean, we had to send back $18,000 in deposits on one business alone, so we were, like, watching our bank balance hit rock bottom, and we just thought we, we're going to have to start dipping into our savings straight away um, so we applied for the Red Cross money, got told no a couple of times, and then I went back to them and I said, well, we have no income. So they ended up, they ended up folding, <laughs> giving us $20,000. Yeah, but, yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were virtually camping in our house. We had no power, no phone, no nothing. Luckily, we had a generator, which we used for the, for the walks. And so we used the generator here for when we had the kitchen or then had to, had to move the generator to get pumped water. And 
that's what we did for about three weeks. Mm -hmm. So safety wise, we had to be here. You you said that um, the the process of applying for assistance actually hasn't been too difficult. Um, so long as you had direct damage, which yeah. is great to hear. Yeah. Um, do you think that would have been the same if the house had burnt with records and things like that? Do you think? Um, probably only because I'm reasonably savvy and I, I cloud base a lot of my um, business documentation and my bookkeeping. It's in the cloud, so... Probably for me, it probably wouldn't have been so bad, but I, I, I would say a, a large majority of people aren't at that point. So, uh, yeah, I would, I really would feel for anybody who was a bit challenged about, like a lot of these businesses are small businesses and they don't have, you know, they have a cash book, you know. They don't have proper records and they certainly probably don't have them stored offline, you know, online somewhere. So... Yeah, that would have been horrendous. I don't know how you would do it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about other people's experience in the area a little bit more? We have have other people applied for loan for for support and been refused, or are you getting the sense that people are getting the support that they need? Other people around. No, I'm not getting the sense that they're getting the support they need. Absolutely not. Um, most people that I talk to are still pretty traumatised by the whole event and the aftermath and the, the lack of understanding about that, that indirect impact. That, that's just really sent them reeling, nearly all of them. Um, you know, and then insurance companies arguing that um, because they weren't burnt, they couldn't access, like, the, income, uh, the um, loss of income and stuff like that. That was... That was I, I I believe from talking to others, it's been really hard, really hard, even with really switched on businesses. Yeah, you've mentioned mental health a couple of times. Mm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more specifically about what that means for your community in the future? Uh, wow, well, and Eden's been Eden in particular has been through a whole bunch of terrible stuff over the last twenty five years. So. Um, well, it's interesting. What was really obvious within a very short space of time was the the community support within the community. A lot of people just came out of the woodwork and everybody seemed to get on. Everyone seemed to be really... And we only talked about this the other day. Everyone was really quite calm because they knew everyone had been affected. I think there was a bit of almost a feeling of camaraderie that we'd all survived this thing. Um, but, yeah, I, I think there's going to be ongoing mental health issues. Even us, sometimes we still crack up for no apparent reason. <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there mental health support? I have I've not. I've, I have not sought support Probably yet because we've been. I think it's still pretty raw. I know it's five months ago, but it's still because of what with COVID and everything. I think that it really just sort of was a double whammy. Um, we haven't personally sought support, but we've thought about it. Yeah. Do you know if it's available? If you want it, I don't know what's available. No. In the past, regional areas have not had a great track record with getting any mental health help. I don't know that it'll be any different. And there's such a huge area in, in Australia was burnt. There's so many communities affected that I don't know whether there'd be enough mental health workers around, to be honest, <laughs> to cover it off. We've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, is there anything else that you'd like the commissioners or the, the public generally to know about things that you think need to be done better that we haven't talked about already in terms of either the period before the fires or during the fires or, or the support period afterwards? We need people to be moved back to regions and those that will build resilience in small communities for the future. So I'm a tour operator, Eden relies on tourism, but we also need other agencies and other businesses 
to prop up our economy so that when disasters like this happen, there's still money in town. There's no money in our town now because of that. And those people have secure, they have secure jobs, they have a secure, when you work for the government, you know that you're covered. You know, you know that you're not gonna lose your job because there's a bushfire, but that's not happening down here. Those people have all been moved away. We need them back. All of them. Mm. <clears throat> National parks are a very large percentage of your local council area, is that right? Yes. Between national parks and forestry, they own 75% of our show and they don't pay rates. So we've got a little tiny 33,000 people shire trying to manage some of the biggest areas of forest in Australia. It's nuts. It's really nuts. And then, then they're begging for money to try to support other businesses like tourism and, and in other industries like that. It's, it's wrong. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Arthur, did you have anything? No, I don't think so. She, she speaks too well. <laughs> yeah. She does speak plenty. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> okay, uh, final question. Yep. Um, your, your area, your community has been through a lot. The first is the fires and there's COVID-19. Um, where do, you, where do you see your local community going into the future? There's a, this is the land of opportunity for tourism. We need support, we need infrastructure, and we need funding to do that. And the federal government and the state government, all of them need to understand that regional communities need constant support Otherwise, we're all going to end up living in Sydney, and I tell you, we're not going there. But um, <laughs> we need to start thinking outside of metropolitan areas and start putting some of the decision making back into the local areas. And Eden, Eden's an amazing place and a beautiful place. Okay. Mm. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.